action! Welcome everybody. This is week 14 of the Hidden Pearls podcast, week 15 for the football season. Uh, so the 49ers are in Dallas this weekend. We are super excited to be here. My name is Emma Kittle. Hi, and Bruce Kittle here. Glad to be here. Only. Um, Hidden Pearls podcast is a show that works to highlight and share the stories of those impacted by social and environmental injustices. This week, our cause is sex trafficking. And um, we're in a pandemic, COVID is very real. Uh, the two organizations, the first one that we were going to work with um, was hit by COVID. And so we could not uh, work with them. Uh, the people who we were gonna interview were very, very sick. So we hope that they get better. Um, and then the second organization, the exact same thing happened. And so um, we did a little audible, changed some things up and we have on the show, uh, Trent Taylor. So this is our quality time episode. I know all of you guys have been waiting for this. Um, so we're very excited. It's it's really great. Trent does a great job. And then um, our other interview is Sarah Taylor. So Trent and Sarah just got married um, and Sarah has um, an attack story. Uh, and you're gonna hear about that today. It is very powerful, um, very emotional. And um, I'm really, really thankful that we have her on the show and she can share her story because she carries everything that happened with her with so much grace and purpose. And um, we are very, very thankful and very, very lucky that she is around to tell that story. Um, so yeah, I love you guys. Uh, okay, so <laughs> with that, uh, ooh, court corner, quote to corner. Um, let's get right into it. Okay, so this quote is, um, take the piano teacher who always says, relax, relax, but how can you relax while your fingers are rushing over the keys, yet they have to relax? The singing teacher and the golf pro say, the exact, say exactly the same thing. And in the realm of spiritual exercises, we find that the person who teaches mental prayer does too. We have, some, we have somehow to combine relaxation and activity. The personal conscious self being a kind of small island in the midst of an enormous area of consciousness, what has to be relaxed is the personal self, the self that tries too hard, that thinks it knows what it is, that uses language. This has to be relaxed in order that the multiple powers at work within the deeper and wider self may come through and function as they should. In all psychological skills, we have this curious fact of the law of reverse effort. The harder we try, the worse we do the thing. By Aldous Huxley. Why'd you choose it? Thank you, Emmy. Um, Aldous Huxley is out of the Huxley family, which is fairly famous, um, but uh, kind of 1800s and early 1900s, but was a writer uh, and a philosopher. So uh, the pieces that he talks about, and so I chose that partly this week because I think it was really true and I thought it was very powerful when I read the way in which he'd laid that out. But it also, it connects directly with our piece on the Mindful Minute this week. So uh, this week we're back to stage four, which is connected body. And so I thought this quote did a great job in laying out uh, kind of this dynamic that we face in the connection and sometimes tension between the mind and the body. So in order to be effective, these two must learn to work together if we ever wanna be successful in whatever we're trying to do. The mind we are taught controls what the body does. It sets up and controls learning gives us the opportunity to execute and perform at the highest level. Yet we also know that the mind can corrupt and undermine our efforts if we overthink it. If we allow anxiety and stress to enter, then the body is unable to perform as we want. The mind is always instructing, always judging, always critiquing, and the body as a result can resist the performance that we seek. We've all been there. While the mind is key in setting up and sustaining high level performance, it must also learn to let go of control to relax, and at times not judge or critique. As the mind surrenders control, it provides the body the freedom to do what the body is capable of doing. This is the relaxed concentration, the flow state, the zen of doing without doing, performing without trying to perform. It is here that we must find the balance between focus and concentration while remaining relaxed, not stuck in the mind, but present in the moment present in the moment that we are in along with the body. And as Bruce Lee liked to say, able to flow like water. 
And our action step is this week, pay attention to the ways your mind limits you from doing all you can, either through anxiety, stress, judgment, or other mental grasping. Focus on your mindful awareness. No. Oh, <laughs> I guess that's right. Focus on your mindful awareness practice, for it is here that we learn to be present in the moment for, and to be free and to free our bodies from the captivating thoughts of our mind. Find freedom through your awareness. Practice letting go. Relaxing, visualizing high performance from a centered place of calm. Seek connection with the body, yet in a state of flow and free to do what you are fully capable of doing. Ease and grace without force or pressure. So we talk a lot about presence this episode um, in many different ways, um, but... Yeah. So this week, especially with the holidays and everything, so no, so just a shout out to everybody because this can be a really stressful time of year between gifts and COVID, getting together, not getting together, family, all that stuff. So um, one, just give yourself a little bit of grace. So just encouragement, have a happy holidays. And just this is a great opportunity, though, to practice that level of mindfulness. So remember, thoughts are just thoughts, feelings, just feelings, make choices, intentional choices about what you want to do. And in this realm this week, learn to perform without anxiety and stress as you kind of let go of all that and trust your body to do what's capable of doing. And something else that has been coming up for me a lot lately is um, obviously I'm with my family and I know that is a massive blessing. Um, I thought you were going to say trigger. Stop it. (laughs) It has in the past, but it's not anymore. Um, But it's a massive blessing. And I know that not everybody... Um, has that opportunity this year and I think um, something that I was talking to a friend about is um, and we've talked about this on the show but not assigning so much meaning to what's going on because just because we're being safe and we're choosing to not physically be together that doesn't mean it's not Christmas that doesn't mean it's not the holidays last night we ate cheeseburgers around the fire pit and listened to Christmas music and it was I feel like the most festive we've been in a really long time and it was great and we were just together and laughing. And um, so, yeah, so I think when you have those triggers or maybe you're feeling alone, um, see them for what they are and maybe journal about them, take some time to actually reflect and see where those are coming from. Um, But don't assign so much meaning and thinking that this is how it is always gonna be or because you're alone that nobody wants to be with you or anything. Or there's just so many very heavy emotions floating around right now. And if you need to talk to anybody, Um, There are a ton of fantastic organizations, fantastic resources out there. So please do not ever hesitate to reach out. Um, You can look through all of the shows that we've done. There's a ton on mental health and just like how to stay present, stay aware, and really check in with your body and your mind and your emotions and your spirit and everything and figure out what you need right now. And it's okay to need stuff. Okay. All right. So with that, everybody. Let's roll. I know we've been waiting, but let's toss it over to quality time. show Trent we're glad to have you man hey you look good good. good to finally be here okay no we've had to we've had to talk to your agent a couple times about getting you on the show oh my god you've been really hard you've been in really high demand Trent like it I we we had to go through multiple people your agent your wife we had to call your mom (laughs) and your dad I had to talk to Rooney it's true tried 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 to talk to Howie but he tried he kicked me out wouldn't, oh, even, wouldn't even hear a word that I was saying. Your dad was kind of the real, he was tough. He's he tough. was. Oh, I, I believe it for sure. But it was Mickey, AKA the best realtor in Nashville. Mickey makes the plays. She got yes. it done. She got it done. Yeah. So we brought it together. shout out to Trent Nelson Taylor for coming on the Hidden Pearls podcast. All right, ready guys? And three, three two, two, one. Action! Wait, Trent missed it. Let's do it again. All right, three, two, two one. one. Action! Ooh. Is that on time? No. no All right, ready? You, do it, you do it. You do yeah, it. You give us a yeah, you, you do it when we say one. You yeah. Clap. Ready, Emma? Three, two, one. There we go. There we go. All right. Hey, yeah. Do you play an instrument at all? It looks like. <laughs> I do not. I do not. It's called Rick X. Taylor <laughs> was not the most musically talented person. You can see that rhythm and soul inside you, right? They're just rolling on. Okay. All, All right. right, everybody. So this week we are in Dallas, week 15 of the season, week 14 for our show. We are very Ooh. excited. Uh, this has been a long time coming. The fans have been asking for it. What? 
Who is that? My wife. And quality of- time. No. Our- quality <laughs> time. We're asking about when you're gonna get on the show. So this week we have. We're here, baby. Over Trent Taylor, Trent mm. Nelson Taylor. So Trent and George have been friends since the 2017 draft, and have provided all of us with some true quality time. That's true. And we are excited to have him on the show. So welcome, Trent. It's welcome. so good to be here. Uh, let's young get it started. TZ. AKA Young TZ. Woo! That was a little musical. Yeah, he can sing. That was good. Should we have a 49ers musical? Yeah, we'll get McGlinchey back. Is this in the future? Yeah, we'll get McGlinchey oh, back for wow. some karaoke musical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 49ers I love choir. It. That's a side to see. We should go caroling. Oh, well, we should. We can go door to door at the hotel. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, we, we'd get in trouble that's somehow true. with some type of rule. Who knows? Hey, we can do a Zoom choir, though. <laughs> You have five or six guys like on. Like less no, we're in. We're in. We're you do the whole gallery view and everybody's on at once. We could do a Zoom choir with the Niners. That would be beautiful for next week. Mm. But to we're get in. everyone's voices hitting the the mic at the same time from different locations is not easy. No, it's not. Fortunately, we have one of the best technicians in Zoomology. In Who is that? I just got headbutt in the face, though, so. You have no proof. I do. We were actually recording. Yeah, we were. This might be in the bloopers later. <laughs> but it was during, there was music being played, so you'll get kicked off if you play the music. Trent Nelson Taylor played college ball at Louisiana Tech, drafted by the Niners in the fifth round of the 2017 NFL Draft. Fifth, fifth round, baby. Fifth round, hey, baby. Listed fifth at five rounder. Rounds. Um, TZ, tell us about how you got to Louisiana Tech. Well, it was a strenuous process in high school of figuring out what college I wanted to go to uh, because Louisiana Tech was my one and only offer to college. So <laughs> I decided to take that one. <laughs> Pretty but uh, but I, did, I, did, I was trying to go to Louisiana Tech, though. Uh, my senior year, they were top 25, like had a really good offense. Um, yeah, they were – known around the country for their offense for their offensive production and the coaches were great uh so i knew it'd be a perfect fit for me so they offered me in the summer and i committed two weeks later and that's that was my whole recruiting process right there did you get an official visit that was my question too uh i did yes was it fun yes we went to the one bar in ruston louisiana ruston uh, had a good old time (laughs) You have to take me there one of these days. Was the visit before or after you committed? The visit was after I committed. Dude, same. That's <laughs> crazy. Right. Really? You did the same thing? Yeah, I committed to Iowa. Then a month and a half later, I was back in Iowa. And they were like, yeah, we'll do your official visit now. And it's on the night before a spring ball practice. So no one's going to want to do anything. And so I sat in my uh, my cousin's dormitory and I played uh, – I'm pretty sure we played NBA uh, NBA Street Volume Two for like three hours, and that was my recruiting. That was my official visit. But the saving grace was that I had an official visit to Iowa, and I had for the both of us. I believe it. There we go, Emma. Did you get into bars underage? Uh, oh no! <laughs> of course not. But when I was uh, Iowa City rocks. Iowa City, you could get in at 18, and then you left by 10 p.m. And I was did you leave not like- 18 yet. I think I was 17. You were. And then I was a did, you child. Leave, did you leave by 10 p.m.? Of course not. Okay. It helps of when you're really she did. Wear high heels. You're like 6'1 out there in heels. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I always think back to those days because we would wear super high heels. Like my, I don't have the same ankle strength as I used to. I can't wear those high heels. Um, okay. So in 2016, Back to uh, trend. Taylor led the nation <laughs> with 1,803 receiving yards on 136 receptions, along with 12 touchdowns. Had the record for career receptions at Louisiana Tech with 327. Do you still have that record? Yes, I do. Um, I clear? believe I broke Troy Brown's record. Mm. And... Uh, no, my my uh, our offensive coordinator. He always thought this guy coming in was going to break my record, uh, but he's not. He's not going to break my record. A guy there now. Yeah. What's his name? Oh. I'm gonna. Look I can't him up. say that. I'm, I'm not going to talk that much trash to him. Well, I'm, I'm going to look up though. his stats. No, I, mean, I don't think anyone's record. close to breaking it right now. Well, the two sources I found with that number, they both made it sound like. 
you had the record. You know what I mean? So but they didn't say that it had been broken officially. So that's why I was wondering. So to your Wait. knowledge, you're still the record holder. Yeah, is it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Did you ever want to get a Bulldog after playing for the Bulldogs? No, because you hear about Bulldogs just being there and how they can't last in the heat or anything like that. Um, like our mascot Bulldog, like literally couldn't be on the field for longer than like 10 or 15 minutes. So it's like, Sounds pretty what's, hot. what's cool about that? Like you can't even be out here with us, but. Is that a reflection? We actually, we had a mascot guy because he got loose and like, I don't know exactly what happened, but he escaped his house he was staying at and was roaming around outside and no one could find him. And he passed away just from heat exhaustion. One of your mascots? Yeah, bad stuff. What was his name? Do all the dogs have the same name or do you have no idea? No, there is a name. Yeah, they all have the same name. And then it's like the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. I forgot if they have a name for him or not. Well, I'm a terrible alum. <laughs> Actually, I'm not even an alum. I didn't graduate. So what? You did. TZ. <laughs> Love college early for that NFL money, baby. Does your mom know yeah. that? Great. Yeah, she she always reminds me of it too. She makes sure of it. Wow. No, I, I did. I made a promise, though. I made a promise that when I'm done with football, I will go back and finish. And what were you beginning a degree in? What was your studies? And finance. Oh, OK. Yep. Oh. And then you'll be a banker? Is Yeah, I can't wait to be a banker one day. I'm definitely not going to be a banker. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hey, your bulldog's name is Tech. Tech, yeah, that's right. Yeah, just simple. Tech, I thought it was like something first. cute for a second, but no, it's just tech. <laughs> you seem so let down. <laughs> it's a clever name because the name of the university is Tech. Louisiana Tech. Louisiana Tech. Oh. So what was your favorite thing about Louisiana and then now about Tennessee? Because now you live in Tennessee. Mm. Uh, my favorite thing about Louisiana, I would uh, the food, definitely. Uh, I'm a big fan of spicy food, Cajun food, uh, crawfish. I could eat like 10 pounds of crawfish in one sitting. Um, and I like to eat it like to where it makes my nose start to run, how spicy it is. Uh, so I do miss that about Louisiana. Did they do the big table spreads where they mix it all up and throw it on oh, the big table? Yeah. You, get, you get the potatoes and the corn rolling with it. Yeah. Oh, that stuff's phenomenal. Yeah, we got to do that. George and I have never done that before. I would love to do that. I've never, like, cooked any myself before. But uh, we can figure out a way to do that in Tennessee for sure. Dude, you had a couple boys in Iowa that did that every year. Yeah. The two twins? Yeah, the Paulson twins. The Paulson twins, yeah. Have, a, like, a little crawfish cookout or something? They, they shipped it in from Louisiana. Yeah, it was. Overnighted it. It was legit. They did a good job. No way. The big boil thing. Yeah, they overnighted it. They yeah. did, like... I mean, it was delicious. It was I'm not yeah, that's, that's a good time. I will say my only thing I don't like about it is just it's a lot of work for not a lot of food. Yeah, that's what a, a bunch of people say, but I love it. So. You got to be dedicated to it for sure. Yeah, definitely. But it's like an event, you know, you're not just like eating. It's like it's an eating event. Do I look like I'm at a crawfish boil? You look like <laughs> you look like you came out of the swamp in Louisiana. And that is a Louisiana <laughs> boy right there. Now. Oh, hey, let's go to wrestling Louisiana, baby. That's right. That's a scary look. Oh my god! You got some, wow. ga hey, you okay, got some so gators wrestle. Then when did your family move to Tennessee? Uh, so I was born in Tennessee, and then I moved to Kentucky until I was like until I was in second grade. And then we moved to Louisiana. And so from second grade on, I grew up in Louisiana. And uh, so my brother went to college. And then the next year I went to college. And as soon as I went to college is when they moved back to Tennessee. Mm. So they've been in Tennessee for like eight years now. Do you think Nashville has as good a food as Louisiana? Nashville has good food for sure. Um, they got good hot chicken, good barbecue places, at least barbecue tacos. I'm gonna go get them as soon as I get back. Um, really good what? Tequila. Really? 
there's good tequila everywhere, isn't there? That's why I love Nashville, because there's tequila everywhere. That doesn't make any sense, but uh, no, nah, Louisiana's food is better. <laughs> you like oysters? Yes, big fan of oysters. How do you, Man. what's your favorite, like, when you eat your oyster, like, if it comes on the tray, like, you just slurp it right away, or do you, like, horseradish, red sauce? Oh, uh, I do the red, the red sauce and the uh, horseradish for sure. And you pre-mix it? Bruce is a big pre-mixer. He'll combine them, mix it up, have a little concoction, and then he'll spread it. Oh, professional. I, I became a big fan of using saltine crackers, too. I love them. Because you just. Yeah, I do that every now and then. With the horseradish, with the red sauce. A little bit of lemon, you know, goes over the yep, top. Yep, a little bit of lemon. Oh, yep, always, always. So, Bruce. Yeah, me and George have always been big oyster guys for sure. Yeah. We try them literally every time me and Trent have an opportunity to eat oysters. We've had some really, really good oysters, and we have some the terrible ones. One. Remember that place we went to in Houston? Were you there for the preseason game? Do you remember? It was with Hicatini. Oh, uh, I think so, yeah. Do you remember Tyler McCloskey met us out there? Yes, and that was all got oysters and they came out warm. Oh yeah, those are terrible. We like I ate two. I ordered two yeah, dozen. That was so and disappointing. Was like Forty bucks. I was like, oh, I'm so I've had oysters since uh, WrestleMania <laughs> last year. I'm so excited. I put down. I ate first one. I was like, I just had to have been a bad one. Second one, warm. Can't do warm. And super slimy. I spit it out oh. and we laid just. I think yeah. I was like I. Coleslaw. Yeah, out. that's it's real depressing for sure. Always all, it's like all bad through. calamari too. Oh, bad calamari. Love calamari. calamari seems to be a real like make or break type of food, type of appetizer. When you go to an Italian restaurant and they have good calamari, and I'm just like, I don't even care what my main dish tastes like because right. that was fire. I'm ready to buy the whole menu. So, Bruce, uh, as our, I'm assuming you've eaten more oysters than all of us. Combined. I don't know, but I tried. Where is can we talk about your favorite oyster restaurant? Oh, what's your favorite oyster? Yeah, favorite you oyster place. Were you going off on the oysters in Cabo? Uh, no. No, we didn't we do did tacos. It. I did them one time, and they were warm, just like Georgie said. Oh. Cabo? Yeah. Where? Did it once. Before we got there? Uh, yeah, and I can't remember, but it was no mas. I tapped out. No mas. Couldn't no do it. I had one. I didn't even go to the second one because it was like just like loogie. that's how bad it was. It's so warm, and then when they're warm, they are slimy. It was like a loogie. Oh, just picture that. Yeah, I just, oh, like, stop. Listeners at home, so, it's like best, someone else's loogie. Best oyster experience actually with George. WrestleMania. WrestleMania in New Orleans. New Orleans. Oh, that was eighteen. Eighteen. That was after the eighteen season. Two thousand eighteen. Little place. Just uh, really, it's about a two blocks in. Red something? Yeah, Red's. Red Door? I can't remember. Red something, though. Um, right on Bourbon Street. Uh, it's about two blocks in off kind of normal. And then you're about yeah. two blocks in. You're just kind of getting. Not even. It was so close. So close to our hotel, but it was so good. And what did we We had the, they were like. Well, we got the normal oysters, which were very good. And yeah. then we got the fried ones, that they, the baked ones, oh. baked oysters. The Rockefeller ones? It was like, it was like the oh. special, it was like their special one though. And they had bacon on it and some cheese or like, something. It was kind of a blue cheese maybe. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I, I think we did three or four orders of it. Oh my gosh. It was, Over the top. Both the, and the beer was like ice cold. It was really we had our own table. New Orleans is incredible. Oh my gosh. It was so good. I love. You can go to any hole in the wall restaurant in New Orleans and it'll be some of the best food ever. It's true. So true. Yeah. New Orleans is, it's. It's some top notch. I love New Orleans. So oh when you gosh. say it, do you say New Orleans or New, New Orleans. Orleans? I know a lot of people in Louisiana say like New Orleans, like right. real slang with it. New Pretty Orleans. Impressive. I'm from New Orleans. I had a, I had a lot of teammates from New Orleans. From New from New Orleans. New Orleans. They're from New Orleans. Yeah. I will never say that. Okay, so let's uh let's get back to a little yeah. football. So Trent Taylor, uh, everybody in the family. So your dad, Greg, played linebacker at Western Kentucky University Coach. from eighty two to eighty five, uh, and he broke a kid's jaw in high school playing no. safety. Trent did. Trent oh, did. you did. Oh yes, I did. Is that a true story? Wow. Yes, it is a true story. Uh, yeah, that's pretty. Poor, poor, poor kids in high school, man. You know, you play, like, a bad team, and I was playing free safety, and, you know, like, the quarterback just sets them up with, like, the worst pass of all time. And that was, like, before, like, targeting and stuff like that was a big deal. 
So like, he, I think he ran a slant route, but he just like straight up just lobs it over the middle. So I'm just beeline and I stick my forehead like right into this dude's chin. And yeah, he was, he was like on the ground, he was out. And uh, they, I think they helicoptered him um, out. And then like the next couple of days we found out he actually broke his jaw. <laughs> oh it was not good he actually hit me up on twitter like a couple years ago like yeah i'm the kid like i yeah you broke my jaw like glad to see you're doing good stuff like that That's i'm hilarious. suing you oh. <laughs> oh. you know anymore they could really well now it's not part of the game so in sports yeah if it's within the context of the game but there's a liability now wow. outside the game. so anyway yeah okay but let's talk more yeah about defense that. was fun in high school Hey, wait, how many, big, how many picks did you have for your safety? Well, here's the deal. Well, I don't want to hear an excuse. How many picks did you have? It's an easy response. How, how it's many picks did you have? Zero, one, two. All right, so I played, I played four games until they decided not to let me play. They just wanted me to focus on offense after that. So the first four games of the season, I had five picks. Oh. oh. I yeah, zero. what? <laughs> That's pretty good. So you want to say five, but you want to make sure we knew you did it in four games. It's five's a yeah, lot. Yeah, I did it in four games. Perfect. Just to let you know. Yeah. Good for you. Wow. Thanks. So you could man. have been a lockdown corner in the NFL as well. Safety. No, I'm good on that. I've actually <laughs> told, I mean, I've told uh, Robert Sala a couple of times. I'm like, hey, if you need a nickel back, like, I got you. But deep down in my head, I'm like, oh, if I have to tackle Ezekiel Elliott, I don't know. A little iffy. Just use your forehead. But, You'd be making some career decisions every freaking Yeah, day. yeah, definitely. I'm not scared to try it, though. Okay. Brave man. <laughs> Are you calling Coach Sala out? Like, uh, yeah, he needs to put me in there ASAP. <clears throat> or I'm done with him. I'm just kidding. That's a way to get my – I want a third down pass rush. Give me, like – give me three of those. I guarantee at least one sack. Guarantee. They do mention that to you every now and then. I wonder how serious hey, they Coach are. Coach, Coach Kerserk is like, hey, Kittle, you think you got a couple rushes in you this week? <laughs> Damn great I am, Coach. <laughs> Give me a yeah, shot. Stop getting my hopes up. Six Just go line up out there. Once in that. Not a big hey, deal. Hey. Okay. So um, your mother, Nicolicious, is our realtor in Nashville. I uh, have mad love for that lady. Um, but she was also Miss Fitness and was a bodybuilder and a bikini comp competitor and was Miss Tennessee and also Miss Georgia, as the rumor. Yes, she was, uh, she was, uh, did a lot of fitness competitions. Hey. Hey. And uh, so she was Miss Fitness Tennessee one year, and I'm pretty sure she was Miss Fitness Georgia. Not positive on that, but. Uh, she competed. She competed in Miss Fitness America and finished 11th or 12th, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and that was she did some of that after she had me and Trey. So she is a complete savage. Smoke. Savage. There's some. There's some pictures of her like pregnant with me or Trey, and you can like see her six pack on top of it. It's pretty. It's pretty wild. Oh, inspiring. <laughs> Well, we're going to be sure to pull up some of those pictures dude. and attach those in the show notes. So Love you, Mickey. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. And uh, last member of your family that we want to highlight is your fabulous wife, uh, Miss Sarah. Mm. Uh, Sarah Chafee, now Taylor. Mm. Um, how is uh, you got engaged in Tennessee? How'd you meet first? Let's just let's just take it all the way back. Give me a quick summary how you guys met. Yeah, let's talk about romance. Real quick. Quick summary. She was a sports reporter. And she hit me up with a project. And then I was like, so I hit her up a couple weeks later. I was like, hey, I got a project for you real quick. We need to meet up and discuss about it. And so, you know, I spit some game to her and uh, it worked out well for me. I love that. So I just remember in OTAs was that 2018. You saw her a couple times on the weekends. Yep. I failed to make a trip. I was yeah, you time. you like never agreed to go on the trip because you thought it was like a waste of time or something. Like we wouldn't have well, fun. You scheduled the trip on a Friday <laughs> night. No, it was a Thursday night. Thursday night. Oh yeah. So you bought a Friday morning trip, Thursday night at 3 a.m. And you're like, we're buying it, we're going. We're just gonna go. And I was like, 
<laughs> like, I don't think I'm going to, then what are we getting back Sunday night? And I was like, yeah, I can't, yeah, I'm okay. Like, I'm just going to guess who went with me. Hickatini. Hickatuna went right. And we with had the you. best time ever too. I know you guys called me a crazy times. things you'll do for love. Right. You know, I'm glad you did that. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, also with Sarah brought in, um, two of your, uh, your two kids. Uh, yes, I do have two kids now, uh, two little boys uh, named Rooney and Howard, mm. two little fluff balls that we love to death, and I haven't seen them for like a month now, and I'm getting kind of sad. Dude, I know. I was, I go a week without Vini, and I don't know what to do, but you had you had oh. Rooney. That's who you first met, and I'm not going to admit, when I first met Rooney, I was like, this little dog is so small, and I don't I never had a dog that was small before. I don't know what to do with it. You were but real, I, yeah. You were real was, questionable out of small. Dogs. I was super questionable the first couple of times I met Rooney, and then I hung out with him, and he's a super. What is straight this straight. thing? Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> Dini's Dini's head is the size of his body. Yeah, but then you get to know Rooney, and then he'll just come like chill in your lap and kick it with. Rooney's him. real OG. That's what he is. He's an OG. That's like his whole attitude. Oh yeah, right? no doubt. He's the man. We got to get some photos of, you know, Rooney and Howard up here. And Howard is a new member of your family. Yes, we adopted him like a month ago, maybe. Two months Something ago. like that. Uh, yeah, and he's absolutely amazing. We had, to, we had to get him trained up. He's a little more wild than Rooney is. Uh, Sarah said when she got Rooney, like, he was always just, like, the most perfect dog ever. Uh, but it, it's, it's taken Howard some time, but, uh, he's coming around. He's awesome. We love oh, him. He's, he's trying to still overcome some of that trauma. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. still not a huge fan of. Oh me yeah. Fun, I mean, just a good fact for everyone, for, for everyone to know, he was thrown out of a car and hit by another car by his past owner. Uh, so this, this foundation or whatever, uh, got him paid for all of his surgery and everything. And, uh, he's moving fine has like a yeah. metal plate in his hip. How many surgeries did he have? Any idea? I'm not, I'm not sure about that. It's tough I to think, I'm pretty sure he had a, he had a couple. Did you hear him? What? How do you get through yeah. airport security with him then? He's got a metal you hip. You can't. We haven't, we haven't tried it yet, actually. So. Man. Well, they changed <laughs> all the service dog stuff, so it's going to be tough. But you have two kids, thanks to Sarah. And let's just go back to Sarah real quick. How, um, you know, getting engaged, you know? When did you, did you just know it was the right thing to do? Uh, yeah, we were dating. We were dating for like at least two years, I think. I'm so bad with dates and numbers. Oh, I don't, uh, I don't need specific dates at all. Trust me. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think like a year into it, we were both like, we both kind of probably less than that. Honestly, we both definitely like had marriage on our mind. And, uh, I mean, we kind of just like wanted to do it then, but, um, you know, might as well wait, give it a little more time. Um, you know, what's the rush? There's no rush for it. So, uh, we kept giving it some time and we kept learning more and more about each other. And, you know, I, I was right from the start. I always wanted to marry this chick and, uh, glad I did now. I have to say, Trent, you are truly one of the most romantic people. So Woo! I, uh, Woo! I am always remind impressed. Sarah of that. Remind Sarah. I am always impressed uh, with your romance, and um, also just want to say, love that you two adopted both of your dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I love that dates and adoption puppy and shelter pups. Oh yeah, get ask Sarah about that. She she will tell you everything you need to know. You will no hear the passion come out of her voice about it. Yeah. Uh, definitely need to adopt adopt puppies instead of buying them. If I would them. if I would ever like buy a dog like from like a little a litter uh, a litter oh yeah she would be furious like a breeder yeah yeah um, I love for, you Dini. Uh, last <laughs> comment is, um, so for your wedding you guys. The low, I mean, it was mid COVID. And so you guys got married on an off day. Um, yes. and 
it was very much like, we're just all going to get together and we're going to do this. And so I was actually in California at the time and I went upstairs and was photographing Sarah as she was getting ready. Mm. And um, the best photos are of her holding uh, Rudy and Howard in her lap as she gets her hair and makeup done. So oh, I've seen those. Those are amazing. I love those. And then we and, have, uh, got the Ritz Carlton and uh, where was that? Where was it, Trent? Where what, the Ritz Carlton, Half Moon Bay? Half Moon Bay, there it was. Half Moon Bay, Bay, yeah. Out on the yep. coast, that was. Did a quick little night. We did our recovery stuff, drove up there, got there in about 45 minutes, and then uh, did the ceremony. Well, that was the first, uh, you know, road trip in my car. My new, uh, I, got, I just got a new car. It was nice. The Audi. Yeah, that we were feeling cool. ourselves. George was going 160 in it. Okay, and what'd you get? What'd you I'm wear for your wedding? What'd you wear? Uh, I had a white button down with some light blue pants and some nice white shoes to go with it, all fitted by um, Sarah Taylor. Who? You know, she she gets all my game day outfits together. She buys all my clothes for me. She's got a way better eye for that stuff than I do, so I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I was loving my outfit on the, the wedding day. I thought we looked good. You looked great. You look good, you did. Okay, so let's talk about, um, so both uh, 2017 fifth round draft picks and have been at the Niners throughout your careers. Where and when did you and George first meet? Frisco, Texas. Uh, I was training there for like a month before George got there. One week. Oh, a week, whatever. I told you I'm not good with this stuff. But uh, a week before George got there, and you know, me and Robbie T were kind of kicking it a little bit. I don't know if Robbie T was there actually. No, he wasn't there. He got no, there yeah, like he got there late. You were a Switzer dog. Yeah, we were like still getting to know everybody at that point, and then this goofy, skinny tight end comes in from Iowa. He's just like a smile on his face. Oh, what's up, guys? You know, like, all right, dude, this guy's hey. cheesy. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but uh, I mean, like our first days hanging out, um, you know, we became friends pretty quickly and then uh, started having some nights on the town in Dallas, went to some uh, Dallas Stars games. So much Hell fun. Time. As uh, high up as you could sit in that stadium. We oh, had yeah. It was like. $20 tickets for the, for the nosebleeds, but it was a great time. We always had a blast. Uh, but yeah, we've just been boys ever since. And then uh, draft day, he got drafted early in the fifth. I was late in the fifth. And I think like the, did I call you or you called me? I was taking tequila shots because we stopped watching TV. Shout out Bruce, good job. And I get a call. <laughs> we had we hadn't talked in probably like I think we probably hadn't talked since the combine. So I mean, it'd been at least like a week or two. We hadn't talked. Yeah. And I get a call. And I was like, "Hey, it's T it's Trent. What what's up, dude? Hey, I Facetimed you, you. Oh yeah, you were like, "Dude, I got drafted." I was like, "Sick by who? The Niners." <laughs> Look what. I, I remember that like my whole family was yelling at the phone and then I saw like Bruce and everybody was on the phone we were just going crazy it was sick it was the first time I met Greg Greg he called me coach twice I didn't even met I'm him I'm sure yet. he did I'm sure he did that's what we miss on you know Greg Taylor is everyone's coach and I love that it's it's so authentic it's amazing he calls everyone coach and then by the end of the day they're calling him coach back so it's just a big coach fest Dude, it's unreal. <laughs> George, what's your favorite memory, favorite story about uh, Trent? About Trent? Well, I've got plenty. Um, actually, I mean, to take it back to Exos just a little bit. So I got there and we were working out and we're they're like, hey, where's Trent at? Uh, he got food poisoning. <laughs> oh, he missed, dude, that was terrible. He missed, like the next, he missed like two or three workouts because he was super sick. And I was like, and this kid's never going to – she doesn't even want to work out. He doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> you thought I, I was just, like, some kid that was just, like – I thought you were nah, just chill. Whatever. No, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we became boys instantly. Because... Wait, but you actually had food poisoning. Oh, yeah, yeah, food poisoning. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I definitely did. And, I yeah, yeah I'll, I missed, like, three days of workouts or whatever. And just, like, I, like, in my head, I was, like, 
dang, I'm going to be so far behind. Like, I was like so nervous about the NFL combine. So I got back there ASAP. <laughs> you really did. Yeah, but we had a blast from the start. But a favorite Trent Taylor story? Um, you know, I'll go football memory. Um, I think Chicago for me. Um, just well, from because you played. <laughs> I just played get a, food poisoning all the time. I know that was another food poisoning story. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but that was uh, the flu game. And he um, he was super sick because I remember I I saw him in the morning the next day. He was at the locker room and he always you didn't take the early bus and you were there before I was. So I was like, damn, dude, you okay? And he looked terrible, sick as a dog. <laughs> he was sitting there like, no, nah, dude, I didn't, I didn't sleep. I've been puking everything all night. And I was like, that sucks, man. Like I literally, I don't think I might've got like 20 or 30 minutes worth of sleep that night. So then he goes out there and goes on to win us the game on a, well, I'm pretty sure it was a spin route. It was spin. Yeah. Spin it was spin against cover two, which like shouldn't have worked. And me being a rookie, like I didn't know what coverage they were in. If I would have known that they were in cover two, I probably wouldn't have tried to inside release them. But I did, and it worked, and we won the game. It was sick. <laughs> like the backer went the wrong way with me. I was awesome. But I mean, it's my favorite story. That um, that that's a great football story because you're completely out of it the entire day. Like you had to catch punts too. That was so funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a that. decent punt return game too. I know, but that was a blast. Um, non-football story. Um, I say, and I, I won't go into extreme detail, but in OTAs of a rookie year, we, me and Trent were sitting in the locker room. And we, I got an email from um, Southwest Airlines and it said, Hey, $49 round trip to Vegas. And I was like, why not? Trent, you want to go to Vegas with me? It's 50 bucks round trip. Yeah, sure. Let's go. It was our rookie year OTAs. Like, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. No clue what was going on, but we were like, yeah, we had three <laughs> days off. Like, because like the first couple of weekends, we were super strict. Like, we can't do anything. Like, we have football. Like, yeah. Lock in. We got to study. OTAs aren't like that, everybody. They're really fun, though. Um, yeah. So we decided to go to Vegas and we had zero connections. We knew nobody. Like, going to, going to Vegas with Richard Sherman, yeah, he knows everybody. It's very easy. Uh, we had my dad uh, booked us a hotel room <laughs> as we're at the Aria. And uh, we were like on like the top left corner of the play. Like it was, I mean, it was a blast, but we had zero connection anyway. We just kind of, I don't know how we really did it, but we just kind of got into everywhere we wanted to go. Yeah. Like we kind of snuck around and we had an absolute blast. And that oh, was dude, like the, we had a blast. Yeah, going to Vegas with Trent, just me and him, zero connections was an absolute, that was so much fun. Yeah, so we, we always try to – me and Trent, I will say, well, we have a – we can make a lot of fun out of absolutely nothing. Like whether yeah, it's playing yeah. like Fortnite during OTAs for eight hours a day or, you know, yeah, going out and playing football. Like we were we were in the weight room doing our lower body lift the other day and, and Shay was like – like we were just in there acting a fool. And Shay was like, y'all have a good time training in the off season, don't you? <laughs> like uh yeah for sure yeah yeah we have uh, yeah we have an uh, yeah day. yeah we have a lot of fun um well trent do you have a favorite george story you want to share when you said that like the vegas story definitely popped up in my head so much fun uh trying to think you came to iowa city for my uh engagement party. oh that was that was a great time experiencing the the legendary Iowa City. Um, I think just a great story is like him being my only guest on my wedding day. Um, so we're like, I'm like practicing my, my vows in the car as we're driving there. And so I'm like nervous about it. You know, I'm reading like the most emotional letter I've ever written in my life. And uh, I mean, George was just like perfect through it, honestly. Uh, you know, he eased the tension for me, made me feel a little more comfortable. It sounds so weird. Mark that nah, up. But, nah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, and you yeah, guys did I mean, it like, George, George like, is right, really good at, uh, yeah, George is good at, you know, making things easier, you know, making you feel, making a comfortable, I mean, making a situation more comfortable and, uh, you know, just kind of talks you through it if you're nervous. Um, you know, kind of same thing he does, like game day football stuff. You know, he's always there helping me out. 
Uh, so yeah, it was good. It was good having them there for, for the wedding day. And then afterwards we just drank a bunch of wine and had some great, some great dinner, some great conversation. Um, we, I think we went around and had a cheers like two or three times. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. And an exclamation point on your wedding day was also big Bob Tunyon. Robbie T scored three Ooh, touchdowns. Monday night, great day. Monday great night football. Day. He did. It was a hell of a day. So yeah, we were all like in our outfits still. Uh, I think we FaceTimed Rob. After the game we did, yeah. Yeah, it was sick. Yeah, we, cause Claire got mad at me because I had the game up live. At the wedding dinner? <laughs> yeah, at, at dinner. And I was like, what do you want me to do? Rob scored two touchdowns. He's gonna score another. <laughs> They're in yeah, the so red zone, babe. I have to watch. Hey, Speaking of Rob, you can't get mad at me. Well, time, ref. This bad boy just came in. Hey! hey! Let's go. Hi. Friend of the show, family member, Rob Tunyon, everybody. He's big we time. He was on time. Good Morning Football this morning. Yeah, our yeah. photo was on there. All I know, that was hilarious. Man, that was, see, that was another good night. I mean, like, you couldn't even talk enough about Nashville, like, we, like I said, oh, we yeah. have fun regardless of the situation. It's a blast. All right, fellas, Trent, talking about other players just a little bit. Who's one of your other favorite sports characters and why? Any sport, if it's football, it's okay, but who's a, maybe a player you admire or somebody you really admired growing up or you think is uh, top notch? Mm. Hard hitting questions. Mm. Probative. Hmm. Football. I don't, I mean, I feel like it's such an easy one to say Kobe Bryant, but, um, I mean, that's just the guy that always comes to my mind, honestly. Uh, just like the stuff you see with his mindset, the way that he approached the game. Um, that's something that I have just like the utmost respect for, um, a guy who has that much drive and that much passion to just be the absolute best. Uh, like no matter no matter whose feelings he's hurting in the process, uh, no matter what it takes, you know he's down he's down to uh, do the work, whatever it takes to get it done. And uh, I mean that's I, I mean that's the mindset that everyone tries to go about um, their job with, but um, few can actually make that happen and like put it into work the way that he did it. Uh, so that's something I've always admired and something that I try to do. Well, and that kind of leads into that next question was just like amongst people who are great players and you probably know more in football personally, but like what are some common traits or characteristics of players who you think, you know, that perform at the top level week in and week out? Like what are the things that make them great from what you see? It's a good question. Well, I'll give you one, Dad. I don't know if I've mentioned this one. I'd say consistency is one that, I'm a huge fan of so, um, you know, guys that show up every single day, the exact same. Um, I mean, example on our team, like Fred Warner, same energy every single day. Oh, yeah, it's really impressive, honestly. The second, the second warm up ends, he's the first guy sprinting from the warm up lines to the center of the field to break down. He's yelling, he's getting everybody fired up. He's the loudest guy on the field when the defense is on there. You can never, the only way you don't hear him is if like you're not there. And so it's just, it's when you have guys like that or the same guy every single day that guys can look up to that guys like, Oh, I have to match that intensity. I think that that is a solid step in becoming a great player. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing is just like guys who don't get too high on the highs or too low on the lows. Um, they just show up and they're the same person uh, every single day, no matter what, like our situation right now, like it'll be tough for us to, make it into the playoffs so like does that mean you you change the way you work throughout the week or not like that's that's where that consistency comes in and uh like people who are great don't need that extra motivation to get something done you know they have that motivation within them and it they keep it within them like no matter what the situation is I think that's the biggest difference well I mean things that you control in the game right are effort energy attitude right those are all things that when you step from your car or from the locker room, whatever you put your feet on the field, that's all stuff that you can control. And if you can learn yep. to do that no matter what and bring it the same way, because the other stuff you can't control, right? I mean, you do your right. best 
the record is the record. Injuries are injuries. COVID's COVID. I mean, you know, it just is what it is. And so, well, then let's let's talk a little bit about this. It kind of spins in that because we're kind of getting that mental stuff. So when you were in high school, you know, just tell us about the evolution of your kind of mental prep game. I mean, <clears throat> how intentional were you about it in high school? And then what happened at Louisiana Tech? You know, when did you start kind of turning it on? And how have you grown as a player as far as your mental preparation in the, in the league now? Uh, I think I've grown a lot uh, when it comes to that aspect of my game, my mental game, um, having a sports psychologist as a wife. Um, that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but that's that's been phenomenal to have. But in high school and college, too, I honestly like I didn't really think too much about it. Like I was never like throughout the week, like, all right, what do I need to do for my mental game? Like I never thought stuff like that. But I think just like the way my dad always taught me growing up, like he like nonstop. He's always talking about like you got to see it before it happens. You got to be able to you got you got to be able to see yourself making the big play before it happens. And uh, so I think I just like did that subconsciously without really thinking too much about it. And uh, I think like as a kid, you know, you're like running around in the playground recess or whatever, and you're doing like last second shot with the basketball or like last second touchdown pass, stuff like that. I think like, I think that helped me a lot, honestly. Like some people might think that's funny or whatever, but I think like, doing stuff like that all growing up like that's all I did like my friends would come over and uh like we would just like put ourselves in like tough situations like that see who could make the big play um I think that kind of stuff like went a went a long way for me and just kind of gave me the mindset that I had all throughout high school and college and making it to the NFL well, now as an NFL guy, do you have a specific mental prep? I mean, do you have affirmations? Do you do visualization on a regular basis? Or, like, what's your game day? I do visualization stuff. Um, like, talking with Sarah a bunch, that's, that's kind of what I've uh, come to, what I like to do. Um, you know, like I said, it was something that I did, like, subconsciously all growing up. But now that I'm, like, more aware of it and more like persistent on doing that I think that's helped me a little bit and um like Sarah will take me through a whole exercise of like I'll write on paper um like the grass like everything about game day you know the fans in the crowd what the grass feels like what my pads feel like on my body you know different sounds I'm hearing from different people and she'll actually like make like a 10-15 minute video um, of her like talking and like taking me through those situations of like being on the field and uh, running routes against my deep against the DBs uh, and stuff like that. And I, I've enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. Guided meditations because your mind doesn't know the difference between the guided meditations and the real life. I mean, exactly. It's, it's the same way. And so you can recreate those events. And so then when you are actually in the event later, you've already kind of been there mentally. And so it's right and you're able to perform at a higher level so yeah i believe in that 100 yeah, percent. very cool okay uh well, i want to ask a question on that so uh as <laughs> um so if you don't know sarah um she loves to read like loves to read she always has yeah read. ever since she's been in arizona um we've, we've spent some time with your girl uh but she's had a book with her like literally everywhere she goes do you read as much as Sarah does, or are you more an audiobook person? I do not. I'm more of a, definitely more of an audiobook person, but I'm reading a book right now that I've been working on for the past five or six months, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I definitely want to get to reading more often. That's something that I'm trying to do. What's the book? What's the book? Uh, the Nike book. Oh, shoe what dog. Is it called? Is that like shoe dog or something like that? Shoe dog, yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, uh, like how Nike was created. Trey, like your shoe dog there. book is sitting in my Airbnb. It's right over there. I was really? gonna say, by, by the, I literally saw that book today. That's yeah, by the pool table. It's just right there. over here. <laughs> I might have left it. Over there. You're crushing it, dog. You're wait, crushing it. Wait, wait. This is the, hey, this is a perfect transition into one of my favorite memories about Trent. 
Oh, this, here we go. Dude, I can't not. Like, it's it's totally at fine at this point. But when we lived together, because thank me and Trent got to live together. Uh, my first our first year in the NFL as rookies, it was me and Claire. We were dating Trent and then JP Flynn, who was an offensive lineman. We lived together the whole rookie year. And what one of the things I realized about Trent is that this dude forgets everything. <laughs> It is insane. And like it just like I thought it was a joke at first. Like I'm not even lying. Like I noticed a little bit when we were training together at Exos. And I was like, nah, it's nothing. We lived together and I was like, all right, yeah. Like this dude forgets his Okay, key. this dude has a serious problem. <laughs> it's a serious <laughs> issue. And let's just fast forward to I think this was last year. Like you and Sarah came over. And when you guys left, you guys were walking out, you walked your apartment. It was like a five-minute walk back to your apartment on the other side of the complex. And you got there and Larry, like, as soon as you shut the door, I looked down and my coffee table had your keys on it, your phone, Sarah's phone, like her sweatshirt and all of Rooney's stuff. The only thing that you guys took was Rooney. And I was like, how long do you I remember him? that? I do we remember. Look at each other. We're like, how long do you think it takes for him to realize that they forgot everything? <laughs> Not lying. 10 minutes go by and you guys came back. Shut up. You walked all oh. the way there and walked all the way back. <laughs> no clue. It. Oh my gosh! I it was one of my favorite things, dude. It no, was I do remember so that. And you, Larry, every time you walk in, don't say it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> you grab it and you walk out. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, I know. It's amazing. Like it's. I don't even get angry. Yeah, I haven't changed too much either, uh, unfortunately. No, no, but now you just live above George. You live right. You're two. Yeah, it's a lot easier to come George, back. It's and, okay. Now, when you forget something, you just throw a bag out over the ledge, and I put it in the bag, and you pull the rope back up. Yes. Like he does for DoorDash. I have to say, one time I was working out on George's patio, and all of a sudden, a bag came lowering down, and I was like, what? <laughs> and I looked over, Look alive and, out there. and you're like, oh, hey, I'm up. Hey, what's <laughs> up? I know, Trent, you're great, too, because you just leaned over and go, yo, yo, dude, up here. <laughs> DoorDash. Hey, over yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, right here. Yeah, come on over. He's lower the bag down. Those people are so confused every time. I know, but like it's ingenious. Like you don't have to leave your apartment. Oh yeah, it's burn the bag and you less hold COVID up. contact. It's really safer. Um, yeah, okay. it's like more lazy, but then you make the COVID excuse and it makes sense. They're like, okay, we'll do it. Well, so let's uh, let's dive right into the fashion preview. So one of our favorite segments is our fashion. Um, so Trent, let's talk a little bit about your game day swag. Obviously, Sarah has had an influence on it, but talk us through. What a typical game day is like for you. You wore a lot of Nike. Uh, Nike guy, for sure. You were with Adidas, now you're with Nike. Yes. Talk about game day swag and what that transition was like for you. Uh, I love Nike shoes a lot better than Adidas. And, Same. Uh, um, yeah, I remember like being with Adidas my rookie year and, and uh, my second year. And there were so many like six shoes that I wanted to wear, like Nike, different stuff like that, that I couldn't wear. So I'm glad I'm finally able to wear like Jordans and all the sick Nike shoes that are out. Um, but yeah, Sarah literally has bought every outfit that I've worn this year. It's been um, recently bought by Sarah and put together like on game days, either like night before or whatever. Like, all right, babe let's pick out the outfit and she'll go in there and she'll be mixing and matching a bunch of stuff until we find the perfect one. And that's my game day outfit every week. So are you a suit and tie guy or just a sport jacket or are you more of a t-shirt? No, nah, definitely like a, like a jacket, like some type of like bomber or whatever, or like uh, with a hoodie underneath. I'm a big hoodie guy. Oh. I, like hoodies a lot. I would say you're like street fashion. Like you're very, you know, yeah. Like like your streetwear is on point. I like. Do it. you think slot receivers is kind of a species are just more likely to be hoodie guys or non hoodie guys? Just ask. Me. I think we would be more likely to be hoodie guys. That's, yeah. yeah. By position. It's kind of like that type of swag, you know, you got to bring to the slot mm -hmm. position. I see. Well, Trent, if you have any shoes that you want to show us that you brought to Arizona, I would love to see them. Otherwise, GK, let's see what you have, my man. All right, ladies. Oh, no. Oh, no. Bringing out, um, it's actually my favorite style of shoe, but not the Jordan ones. Um, they're the Blazers, specifically the off-white Blazers. Blazers are dope. 
I'm a huge fan of these bad boys. They are beautiful. The all are those white. like see through? No, they're just white. Oh. They kind of look like I know what you mean. It's like they have a layer of like yeah. it's almost like the reflective, like glow in the dark type. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of these. I want those the, are sick. I want the lime green laces, the neon green laces. Sorry, um, little Joker vibes. Uh, but blazers are my favorite. And specific, specifically the um, the off white blazers. I have the Serena's. I have the Hollow Eves, which are the orange ones. The Serena's are gray, and then I also I got some blazers ones. that got delivered today to the hotel. Ooh, yeah, the, the, show us? the blue ones. Well, no, I don't have them yet. They're like they're I think they're in the locker room. Yeah, but I do have these Jordans. Oh, right off the foot. Off the foot. Oh, nice right off hot. the foot. Nice Ooh. and hot. Oh. Those are nice. You know, about it. Wait, they actually yeah. come, they this come one. like different colors like this. Oh. That's how the pair came together. I didn't have my size. I'm still upset. Yeah. Like these are pretty sweet. These, I think these are extremely comfortable too. That's I have, I have a couple other uh, pairs of these. So I like these a lot. George is shoe shopping while you talk no, about I'm shoes. trying to find them. Oh. <laughs> One that he has done there. Well, I'm just trying to see what the name of those ones are because I can't remember. You guys can keep talking though. Okay. Very cool. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Page two, BK. Okay. Go. All right, Trent. Part of a mission with our Hidden Pearls podcast is sharing the stories about the uh, people and communities impacted by social and environmental injustice. And so each week we look at a charity. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit. Of, so each week we talk with our player guest a little bit about just kind of the role of service and giving back and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I know your parents and they're very faithful individuals and, and all that. So I'm guessing you probably had a little bit of that growing up in that. And then, I don't know, did you guys do anything in Louisiana Tech? But can you just walk us through a little bit about the role of that in your life growing up, Louisiana Tech? And then I got a few things down at the Niners that I know you participated in. You've been very active with the team doing some things and all that kind of stuff. So, but just how was that growing up? and? Why was it important to you guys? And what were some lessons that you learned growing up? Yeah, growing up, my dad was uh, real big in like teaching us lessons about, you know, like giving back and giving to those less fortunate than us. And, um, you know, like growing up, I always saw my dad, he would pick up, he would pick up some homeless people, drive them to where they need to be. Um, you know, anytime we saw a homeless guy, my dad would pull over and uh, bring some food to him. You know, sometimes sometimes bring him into the car, take him to a drive through and my dad would just kind of talk to him, you know, help him through, you know, whatever situation that, you know, whatever kind of talk that they needed at that point. Um, so my dad was extremely uh, well with that stuff because, you know, like these days I see a homeless man, I'm kind of like, you know, it's a little nerve wracking thinking like, should I talk to this guy? Like, is he taking advantage of me or what? But um, I think regardless, my dad was really good at just showing those people love, um, you know, no matter what they look like, no matter like how they approached them. You know, I, I feel like I've seen I've seen some homeless people like come at my dad with some like, you know, an angry tone. And my dad always found a way to like, you know, ease the situation, and you know, talk to him with love. Uh, whether they deserved it or not and um, we also had a lot of Thanksgiving where we would um, take meals to less fortunate people um, Christmas we would do stuff like that um, and I, I think that stuff is really important something that I'm definitely going to do with my children and my family all right well and then at the Niners let's see I know you worked uh, 218 and they always do a thing with Martha's Kitchen you guys help serve meals and do all those kind of things and then in 218 and two, you've done the My Cleats, My Cause stuff. And so who, I know you, you were telling me this, you did the Tebow Foundation this year. Is that yep. right? Okay. Yeah, I did the Tim Tebow Foundation this year. And um, the year before that, I was uh, did in slavery, Tennessee, which um, is another another organization that deals with sex, sex and human trafficking. What should I call it? Like human trafficking or well, sex me, trafficking or... I put a couple things together for that. So, and, and so actually um, this week, our charity focus is actually your charity from Tennessee. So the end slavery 
which is a uh, human trafficking. So I've got a couple things on that. Maybe I'll just do that. And then I know you've got a bit of a personal story on that. And so let me kind of give some background here. And then right. you can tell us a little bit about that. So um, in slavery of Tennessee, thank you, Emmy. Uh, they provide specialized case management and comprehensive aftercare for human trafficking survivors and technically addresses the problem through advocacy, prevention, and training of frontline professionals. So um, their mission in slavery of Tennessee is to promote healing of human trafficking survivors and strategically confront slavery in Tennessee by engaging and educating the public so they understand the issues and the impact on victims in our community, and then to empower the public connect, to connect with involved organizations as they take action to end slavery. So I know when we were getting into this, because you we've all been talking about this for a while, because we wanted to have you on the show and talk about this. So what exactly is human trafficking? So I had to kind of look it up. So just to clarify, the United Nations defines human trafficking as the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by improper means such as force, abduction, fraud, or coercion for an improper purpose, including forced labor or sexual exploitation, and it takes many forms. And so the stuff on the end slavery website includes forced domestic servitude, which is really a big one. People bring in, you know, non-English speaking or whatever country and tell them they have to stay or they're going to get deported and they don't get any money and they're really in servitude. There's forced labor where people kind of do the same thing. And then the sex trafficking, uh, millions of folks stuck in the commercial trade of sex and the debt bonded forced labor where people go into debt and in certain countries it's legal for people then to be in bondage and they have to work off without making any payment until that and there's millions and that's the largest form of human trafficking in the world then child labor uh, not being paid and forced into labor and then forced marriages is another huge category so particularly women sent out of the countries for money to people that they had no idea about and no consent. So those are kind of the forms of it. So how many people? Right now at a minimum, they estimate 21 million people and other estimates, including some of the other categories, up to 45 million people globally are caught into some kind of human trafficking uh, event. So anyway, so with that, that's kind of a backdrop to that. So that's the stuff that In Slavery works on and there's some other organizations as well around um, and so, and I know that's one. So tell us a little bit then how you got hooked up with end slavery and why this issue is important to you. Yeah, I got connected with them because my mom, I actually found out my mom uh, did some volunteering there. Um, just dry, uh, I think she was just like driving some of the girls like to dentist appointments or like doctor appointments, stuff like that. Um, so she, she got to know a couple of them just like having those rides with them in the car. And uh, just some of the stories that you hear that they've went through is just like completely heartbreaking stuff. And like something that you think like, I couldn't imagine this happening to someone that I know, someone that I love, like one of my family members. Uh, so stuff like that has kind of always stuck with me when I hear about it. And um, my wife, Sarah, um, sh she can tell you all more about this, but she had an experience where um, she was on a run in San Diego and there's a guy who tasered her and tried to throw her in the back of her car, which I would guess that it's for some sort of human trafficking situation. But um, yeah, so she was tasered by a man and uh, he grabbed her, was trying to throw her in the back of the car, but she fought her way. She fought away from it and uh, just ran off and escaped, luckily. But um, just to think that like she was that close to possibly being a victim of just all those hideous crimes and whatnot that those people go through, um, that stuff just kind of hits me deep when I think about it. So it's something that I've always wanted to uh, help out in any way I can. Well, and we're going to have, uh, Sarah's going to be on the show next, and so she's going to have an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about that and some of the involvement that she's had, so with that. So, um, so again, we kind of extend that to her and just know that there's a lot of folks that don't get away and that are captured in that kind of way, and our hearts and thoughts and prayers are with those folks, and so it's certainly something we want to draw, draw attention to. So just looking at the End Slavery website, they talked about what people can do to help so obviously donations of money is really helpful. Volunteering, they do have opportunities just like your mom. And locally, both in San Jose and the Bay Area, their organizations and kind of nationally as well. So volunteering 
And then one thing they really recommend is making sure that you're reading up on the corporations that you do business with um, so that you're making sure that they are slavery free. So some of the corporations aren't very clear about that. Uh, others have very direct policies, but it's something that you could at least make sure that you're not providing money to and doing business with an entities that haven't made a slave free commitment. Uh, and then the other thing that they all listed was education, advocacy, and support. So the more we learn, the more we need to speak up and talk about it, make sure the issue is kind of on the forefront with people, and then to support the victims uh, impacted by this as we go through that. And advocacy with lawmakers and law enforcement to the extent that we can. So I don't know, I know that's a lot and appreciate you sharing that. And we're looking forward to hearing from Sarah. Anything you want to add on that at all, Trent, that I don't want to rush you through anything? Uh, I don't think so. I just like when I think just like when you find a situation that like you hear all these crazy stories and it's kind of like something that you can't really relate to. But whenever you can like picture it as one, one of your family members, somebody that you love, because these are all very normal people like that, like Sarah getting kidnapped, that could have easily been her. And I would have never met her and she would have never become my wife. And, you know, it could have happened like that. Like, luckily she got away. And so like, whenever it becomes personal like that, I think that's when, um, you know, when you really want to make a change and when it really hits you uh, that this stuff is real. It is. So let me well, Yeah, I, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the next interview with Sarah, but I remember the first time she told us, it still like brings me to tears thinking about it because yeah. it's so like, and you guys are gonna see Sarah and you're gonna hear her and she's just so, I hate to say normal, but like, just like- Right, a, yeah. Person where it's like, if she like never told me about that, I would never think about it, but her story is, crazy powerful and she's worked very hard to raise awareness and it has pushed her into the career she is in today. So um, yeah. it's a really great story. But yeah. with that, Trent, um, what, uh, where's the hope? So what's uh, one or two things that give you hope um, kind of in this situation and as we are entering the week of Christmas and with the new year. So on any of those things something that gives me hope like in the human trafficking world or or otherwise we just want I mean, to end on a little positive no 2020 has been like a huge year so like you know yeah, and it's been tough i mean so like for an example so when we talked to dj jones last week like he said like just like what gives him hope is the fact that people are having conversations about these topics you know like yeah, 10 yeah, yeah. years ago like conversations weren't happening and so i mean whether it's you know, you have a chance to like Sarah will have a chance to share her story. And like Bruce said, there's not a lot of, you know, there are people that don't get to share their story because they are still in that and it's awful and horrific, but there are people that, you know, have experienced that and have gotten away or have gotten out of it. And, you know, I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I, I don't know, I could not connect with that at all. And I, I can't imagine yeah. the pain and the, um, you know, how scared and awful that whole experience was, but when Sarah has a, you know, a platform and she can share that story and people can relate with her, um, you know, might, like, that's what gives me hope is she's telling her. Yeah. Story, the more people I would that, say that, like, yeah, that's, what that's gives kind of me hope is the fact that, you know, everyone has a voice like in 2020, like everyone has a platform that you can use. And, uh, you know, what gives me hope is the fact that there are organizations everywhere that help try to fight this problem and you know there's plenty of organizations that are probably in any city that you live in that there's you know there's something that you can donate to there's some place that they need your help and the thing that gives me hope is the is the fact that we all have the opportunity to help these people out you know there's the resources that are out there that people are working on and that people are setting up they just need volunteers they just need a little more money and i think we all have the ability to help stop um all these these crazy situations and these crazy um events that these people go through the fact that we all have a voice and we all have the opportunity to make a difference i think that's what gives me hope yeah true that Trent. yeah 
All right. Well, here's encouragement to folks to use that voice. You know, whatever issues are passionate to you, then, you know, this is a great time of year to participate, to go volunteer in a COVID safe kind of way, to donate money and or time and resources. And so um, just appreciating and living in gratitude about the things and the blessings that we have um, and knowing that there are people in all kinds of situations that are struggling. And this year, particularly because so many people out of work because of COVID and yep. the housing situations and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, great time to, um, you know, share what you have in the way that you can in the areas that you're at. So, well, uh, I feel like because your wife is about to be on, um, as we wrap up, you want to give a little, uh, toss over to Sarah. Ooh, like an intro. I'm gonna give my intro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And here we are the five foot six. No. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yes, everyone, my wife is coming on and she is the most incredible person that I know. And I know that she's going to be completely open and vulnerable with everyone about, uh, what she's gone through and her experience with this. And, uh, I just love her with all my heart and I can't wait to listen to it myself. Hopefully it won't bring me to tears, uh, the hundredth time. Amen. But it, it'll be a great story for everyone to hear and something that we can all just learn from and grow from. It will be. All right. Trent, we thank you so much for being on Hidden Pearls. We appreciate you very much. You've been a great friend of the family, as are your mom and dad. Love them to death. They've been so good to us. And so we appreciate all you guys. So thank you for being on the show and uh, stay healthy and that. And we're looking forward to some more quality time. Hopefully. Let's go in more quantity yeah. sooner than later. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Right, I do have, I got one more thing. Um, would you like to, um, you know, part of our friendship is um, we play Xbox together. And um, it's something that's been missing in our life lately. You it know? has been. You know, I don't play as much when my family's around. It's so true. Just anyway. like our, just like quality oh, time on the field. We haven't had quality would, time would, in our mind. Oh. Would tonight be a good night? Would tonight work, Trent? Do you think you got time, Trent? Uh, let me check. Yeah, yeah, I got some time. Um, but what my point I was trying to get at is, is there a certain squad that you would like to give a shout out to? Because, you know, a person, you know, uh, Reagan Hall, a.k.a. Wooga Booga, is an avid listener of Hidden Pearls. And so he, he will hear this message. Shout out to Wooga Booga, the most savage Call of Duty player of all time. Uh, he carries every one of us in the bomb squad, um, and every war zone match. And I actually, I think he like gets tired of playing with me sometimes. Like I run some duos with him every now and then. And like, when I die, I just feel so bad. I'm like, gosh, he, I know he hates playing with me. <laughs> it's like he's carrying you. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm like, I know he, I know he wishes he had a better teammate right now. But you know what the great thing about Wooga is? I'm just kidding. It's not He's right. always an absolutely fantastic vibe. He is. Um, fantastic vibe. That's all that really matters. That is all that matters. You're playing video games. Have a great yeah. vibe. And so for everyone out there, please have a great vibe tonight. Yeah. I hope you have an incredible day, afternoon, evening, whatever you are going through. Smile today. Might make it someone else smile. Say good morning. Stay six feet apart and wear a mask. And stick around for Sarah. And stick around for Sarah and George's questions at the very end. Excellent. All right. Bye, TT. We All love right, you. See you. All right, welcome everybody. So we are super excited to welcome my good friend, our family friend, Sarah Taylor, wife of Trent Taylor, um, who you guys just met. Uh, Sarah is on to share her story of an attempted abduction she experienced. So we are so grateful to have you here and to get to know you a little better, Sarah. So welcome to the Hidden Pills podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be joining you both. I love you, you both dearly and your family dearly. So this is exciting. We have been on quite the ride together with the Niner family, so uh, okay. we have that, we have. Goodness. Um, okay, so a little background on Sarah. Uh, Sarah is a mental performance coach who guides performers to be becoming their best through sports psychology and mental skills training. Sarah received her master's in science and sport and exercise psychology. She currently works with professional athletes, helping them train their mind. A former sports reporter, Sarah has spent her entire career learning from elite athletes. She is passionate about helping others explore their best 
psych psychological well-being. Sarah is recently married to Trent Taylor, runs marathons, and is very, very passionate about caring for and rescuing animals. In <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah, um, the Hidden Pearls podcast is all about sharing the untold stories of people impacted by difficult situations, social and economic um, and environmental. And it's very uh, interesting to be able to have it's just, a, it's a, I like the dynamic. Um, I'm grateful that you, we have you on the show because uh, knowing you on such a personal level, um, I think is what's gonna make this podcast uh, probably gonna make me cry the whole time. Um, but just how normal, um, and I said this on the show with Trent uh, and everything. And so I'm really excited to kind of share who you are as a person and then how you have really just transformed your life and the awesome woman you are now. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to talk about this. Uh, so let's start with some romance. How about that? <laughs> so Sarah just, got married. Sarah just got married. Also, Sarah, uh, Trent did quite the introduction for you and I know you haven't seen it yet, but um, he did a little softball pitch up for you. So. I think no the are, if they're not in love with you, they're, they're probably in love with you now. So, um, oh my gosh, this is, this is awesome. Uh, he's the best. He is a good one. So, um, as you and Trent, uh, well, as noted before, you guys are recently newlyweds. So congratulations. We know Claire and George were thrilled for both of you and we're your only wedding guests. Uh, we talked a lot about that earlier. So how is married life going? You must really love them, huh? Our, our only two guests there. Um, <laughs> married life is epic. I always tell people like marriage is really epic. Like I actually, I, I was just telling someone this the other day, like dating Trent was one thing and I was really in love with him then, but like, it was so weird when we got married. It's just like a person, like this is my forever. This is my best friend. This is my teammate. And like, I didn't think I could love him more. And like those so, you know, they're like, I didn't think I could love you anymore. Like I love, I didn't think that. And I love him more and more every day. Like, I mean, sometimes he drives me crazy when he like leaves his clothes on the ground, but I, I still couldn't love him anymore. So marriage is epic. Um, my biggest thing and, and, and why I, I really look up to Claire and George too is marriage doesn't sometimes gets portrayed in, in, um, kind of this, you know, negative light. And so I've always really, I, I, I've, you know, my mission is to really just show other people how cool marriage really is. You know what I mean? You just got to find the right person. And it's so funny. I'm out here in Dallas working, doing some business. And I was working with, um, you know, one of the professional golfers I work with. And he was saying, you know, my mom always said marriage, um, it's the only person in your whole life that you get to pick. So I thought that was so cool. And I'm, I'm so happy I, I picked Trent and I'm happy that he picked me. We, we have fun together. You guys do have fun together. You guys are <laughs> hilarious together. She's pretty gushy. So is he though. So it was pretty cute. Oh, well, I don't mind being gushy. I, I, I love yeah. him. Great. We love you guys too. Okay, so sports psych. So obviously a huge part of Thunderbird performance and what created the Hidden Pearls podcast is mental performance and mental training. And so even as uh, Bruce and I were kind of chewing on and like like before you have a business or before you have this big idea that kind of comes through, through fruition, um, I was picking your brain about different things and how pieces go together. And I was like, Sarah, I have this idea and it's really big. Like, how do I bring it in. And it's been really fun to have a friend like you who is in the same like mental training world and who has her master's in it, um, who is very, very qualified. Um, so Trent spoke with us on how much you have helped him um, and how valuable he has found some of the things that you have taught him. Um, so where and when did you get your degree and what drew you into sports psychology? So I got my degree um, actually recently it was in, um, I, I finished, um, my program in, in May of 2020. Um, so fairly recent and, and I went to California state university, Long Beach and, um, yeah, it was a, it was a master's in kinesiology and sport and exercise psychology. And, and along with that, learning about motor skills and, and everything that goes into that. Um, I'm really grateful for the work because, um, you know, I, I feel like sometimes like 
I, I was just thinking this the other day, gosh, when I wake up early, you know, it's a grind and, and like anything, and I wake up, you know, really, really early and have these long days. And I look forward every single day. I look forward to going to work and, and I've been in the position where I didn't look forward to going to work. So I'm just so grateful that I love what I do and I'm grateful for the con human connection along the way and, and all the cool people I'm able to meet along the way. And, um, you know, I would like to think that hopefully I'm making some sort of a difference, but the people that I'm working for sure are making a difference in my life. So I'm just really grateful for, for, you know, the opportunity, um, to, to be working with people and, and teaching them how to, you know, use this incredible lethal weapon that we have inside of us for us rather than against us. Cause oftentimes, you know, we've all been there. Our mind gets in our own way and, and it can really take us to some really dark, scary places if we let it. So it's all about harnessing it and letting it work for us and to propel us rather than to hold us back. So I'm, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> Well, when did you just along your educational journey, though, I mean, had you always thought about doing sports psych stuff or was there was there a moment or a point in time? Because I know you've been around athletes. You were an athlete um, that you really started paying attention to the mental game and that then you decided to transition to focusing on your education and making that a career. Right. How did that so happen? I used to be actually, a, a, you know, a former sports reporter, as you guys mentioned. So I was working um, Fox Sports San Diego prime ticket in LA. And, you know, part of my job was to sit down one-on-one -on -one with athletes and do feature stories. So, um, you know, through that, it kind of felt almost very similar, like a, a therapy session, but, you know, I would see how a lot of these athletes were struggling mentally. And it just conjured up this idea of like, well, Hey, how could I, like, I wanted to talk back and help them, but I had no tools or any knowledge of how to do so, you know? So I explored sports psychology. It was really, um, it, it wasn't as popular, I guess, as, as I would say it is now is certainly a growing field. Um, you know, so I, I had to do a lot of research about it, but I, I realized that you could make a profession out of it. And, um, you know, a, a big part of my story is actually what we'll talk about, about, you know, the incident and the attack that happened, um, totally changed my outlook on life and my perspective on everything. And I sought help through all of that and was working with a therapist that was teaching me psychological skills and teaching me how to train my mind to overcome this severe PTSD and, and trauma that I had faced. And, you know, my mind was in a really bad place. So through all that, I really had this passion. I, I was like, this changed my life. I want to do this. But it was never really an option for me not to work in sport. Sport's my passion. And to realize that I could combine the two uh, and make a career out of it was mind blowing to me. And I said, this is this is what I feel like I need to be doing. Um, you know what I mean? It just I felt really called and I felt like if the doors were open, I was going to walk through them. So it felt like a little bit of a risk leaving my dream job at the time. But um, I'm just so much more fulfilled and I feel like I'm living my purpose. Right. Well, that's very cool. So well, each week now we do kind of talk with the athlete guests about some of the mental performance stuff. And a lot of times, you know, they're transitioned from high school to college and into the league. And, you know, usually there's just like everything, there's a maturation process within that. You know, they become most often a bit more sophisticated about it, more intentional about that. Are there, are there key components to some of the things that you work with that you think are super important? Just, and not too much detail, but just some like core Kind of building blocks for people thinking about mental performance that would be you know, part of your normal routine with somebody? I think the core mental and psychological skills that I like to start with are um, confidence. A lot of people don't know that confidence is a trainable skill. We can train our confidence and that, that comes from, uh, you know, productive and positive self-talk. So what are you saying to yourself? A lot of people actually have no awareness of what they're saying to themselves. So the problem with that is, you know, they're talking trash to themselves without even knowing it, and it's impacting their confidence. And our confidence is so fragile. So, so we really need to be aware of what we're saying to ourselves and, and talking to ourselves in a really, um, you know, productive way. And, and um, so I, I think, you know, certainly self-talk is a big one that I like to drill in. Um, but, you know, I think where the mental game really comes in is helping athletes, and this looks different for every single athletes, but or for every athlete, but helping athletes get into the present moment more often. 
because the present moment is where life happens. And you guys know as athletes, you know, there's, you know, three places our mind can be. It can be in the past, it can be in the present, or it can be in the future. But there's only one place that our body can be, and that's in the future. That's in the here and now. And we know to be at our best working, uh, you know, whether in our, it's in our craft or our sport, whatever it is, our mind and body have to be aligned. So we need our mind to be on time with our body in the present moment. So a lot of the work that I do with athletes is helping them get into the present moment more often. And that looks different for everybody, whether it's a cue, whether it's a phrase, whether it's a breath, it could be anything. And, um, you know, I, I just think that so often we miss out on the best parts of life happening in the here and now because we're so distracted. There's things vying for our attention all day long. And the present moment is really where the beauty happens in life and in sport. So those are just a few of the things that I think, I, you know, I think that are really foundational in, in the mental game. Okay. Uh, and totally agree with all of that. So great stuff. And then what about with some of the folks that do consistently perform at a peak kind of level, do you find kind of common attributes between some of those? And like you said, like their particular technique and style for getting to that point might be a little bit different, but are there commonalities amongst some of those peak performers that you've seen? Absolutely. And I think it all begins with consistency outside of sport. They have consistent routines. They're doing the little things. The, how you do one thing, how you do the little things is how you do everything. So th they're consistent with their approach. They're consistent with their routines and, and their preparation. And, you know, what I find is there's this relentless pursuit to excellence um, versus just doing it when you feel like it. Cause you know, you're not always going to feel like it and you're not always going to feel great. Um, but the best in the world do it no matter what they do, the small things they do, you know, they, they don't get bored with the basics. They fall in love with the process. They're not focused on the outcome. They know that if they do uh, the small, consistent daily things that they're, the outcome will take care of itself, but they show up every single day and, and they're consistent in their approach. And, you know, they keep the main thing, the main thing, I think. So, and, and that might look different for everybody, but I think it's those little consistencies that add up into those big wins for them. So that's in my time, that's what I've noticed the best in the world doing. Can you talk a little bit about visualization? So Trent uh, was, talking about how you guys will do visualization processes and how it's really helped him. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, visualization is one of my favorite things in the whole world. And it can feel kind of weird for people who don't know what it is because it feels a little like witchcraft. But basically how I break it down to athletes is our brain actually doesn't know the difference between a real event and a really well-imagined event. So when I say a, a well-imagined event, like we daydream all day long. I daydream about things all the time. But the key with visualization is you must include all five senses. So what are you hearing? What are you feeling? What are you tasting? What are you seeing? It, you know, I, I forget all five senses, you know, but you have to <laughs> include all five senses. And, and, and that helps you conjure up this really vivid image. Does that make sense? So, so we got to get it as clear and as crisp as possible and our mind actually doesn't know the difference so what the athletes is trends in Trent's situation last you know, he had this really um uh really terrible injury and he was stuck on a couch for months straight and you know what i told him was uh you know if you're if you're using visualization you're out there still getting reps and this is also great for athletes because you can you if you if you're you know visualizing and, and and getting really specific with it you know you can lay there and get those reps without the wear and tear on your body. So it's great for injured athletes. It's great for athletes who just want to work on maybe a specific skill. Um, you know, I, this is something I use with my golfers all the time, and and they're able to visualize. They go play eight holes, or you know. Uh, they, they go play nine holes or 18 holes um, just by visualizing, you know what I mean? Um, so visualization is, is incredible and in what you can do for it. And it's so cool because if you, it doesn't have to be just sport. Like, let's say you were nervous about maybe giving a sales pitch. Well, go lay in your room, close your eyes and imagine the sales pitch. Imagine, imagine yourself, you know, ex uh, executing flawlessly and, and feeling confident and uh, it would go. Imagine some of the questions you're going to get and 
and what you're going to be saying in, in response, that type of thing. Um, but it's got to be really specific and you, you got to get those five senses in there. Otherwise, it's just daydream. Um, so that's, that's just a little peek in visualization. I think it's one of the most, um, underutilized skills. It's, it's incredible what, what, you know, the research behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we talk a lot about visualization, especially on this show. Um, okay. Last question on sports psych is so with Trent, we were talking about how you are an avid reader. Um, <laughs> so I want to, <laughs> so I want to know, uh, book recommendations. And then obviously you have trained and been around some of the top psych or sports performance people so is there somebody who really resonates with you or you know one or two that you just really that speak to you for sure so to cover the book the book side of things i'm i love that he said i'm an avid reader i love reading it's like probably one of my favorite things so thanks thanks babe um i think some of my staple books that i i just I've read over and over again, the first one, Chop Wood, Carry Water. Uh, you read, you could probably read it in a couple hours. It's like one of the easiest reads, but it has impacted me so much because it's really about falling in love with the process and the journey of life rather than, you know, getting so fixated on the outcome and where we want to be. Um, so I just love, there. there's just such, such cool stories in there. And I think it's a great read. So Chop Wood, Carry Water is one of my favorite books. Um, I love the book Atomic Habits, The Habit Loop, um, How Champions Think, <laughs> uh, and, and Mind Gym. Mind Gym is probably one of my favorite books, and uh, Raise Your Game by Alan Stein Jr. And any any book that Jocko writes, I love Jocko uh, Will it, Wilnick, Wilnick, I think it is. I, I don't know how to say his last name, but um, he's a former Navy SEAL, and he's great. So those are, I threw out like a million. So yeah, get your hand up. I'll put them in the show notes for people. Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, and then someone, you know, there, there's so many incredible people in the, in the sports psychology world, you know, and, and I'm really grateful uh, to a lot of them who have mentored me along the way. Um, I flew out to Minnesota when I was in graduate school and lived out there for three months and um, shadowed um, Dr. Sindra Kampoff, who's the sports psychologist for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, so it was incredible to learn under her. And she's really broken a lot of barriers for women in this space and, um, you know, shown up for females. So I, I admire what she's doing. Um, yeah, oh gosh, there's just so many, uh, so many incredible people. Someone that I really look up to would, would be Dr. Michael Gervais. Um, he works with the uh, Seattle Seahawks. I don't know him personally, but um, you know, he's done great work in, uh, in this space. So, uh, definitely, definitely love them. And there's so many other people, uh, too, but those are two that, that have really impacted, uh, my career. Yeah. Well done. There are a lot of folks out there in there doing some stuff. So that's great. And those are two very good, um, folks. Well, let's, uh, how about then let's talk a little bit about animal rescue. Do you want to tell us about your two favorites? Because uh, Trent went into a lot of detail about that, so we got some stories, and um, we, of course, both know both of those characters. But anyway, if you want to tell us a little bit about that and how this got to be such a passionate issue for you as well. Yeah, you know, my pride and joys are my two sons, Howard and Rooney. We call them the boys. Um, they are the apple of my eye, but, um, you know, both of them are, are rescues from high kill, uh, high kill shelters, high kill organizations, and um, you know, Rooney was the first dog that I adopted and I was, you know, taking my first job across the United States in Alabama and I knew that having a dog with me was going to be really good for my mental health and uh, my, you know, everything. He's my pride and joy. So, you know, I, I went looking, petfinder.com is a really great resource if you're looking to rescue because it will find um, animals in a specific breed near your zip code and it, it's just awesome. So I was looking for a female, wanted a female, I thought. And one day my mom goes, why don't you just look for a, a male just to try? And I did. And he was the first one that came up and his name was Scratches at the time. Um, but I, I went to go meet him and he was an angel. He had, um, you know, really matted fur, feces all over him, um, fleas, tick, everything. He, I mean, he was a mess. And um, I like, like to say that I saved him, but he saved me in, in the end. And he's my pride and joy. And, and Howard is our newest. He um, was actually 
thrown out of a moving vehicle and hit by another one had to um, they were going to euthanize him on the spot but he was just such this gentle kind spirit that they called um, uh, Gidry's guardian which is the most incredible organization and they saved him and they paid uh, I think it was around eight thousand dollars in medical bills for him and he got metal in his hips. He's a toughie. He's brave. And, you know, he's taught me so much about life. So we're working with him. He's got a little bit of trauma, but, um, Gidry's guardian on Instagram, they, uh, you know, a a sports reporter for the Dodgers, Alana Rizzo is in charge of, of, uh, Gidry's guardian. And and they do incredible things because they take the dogs that, um, are just so le- so severely neglected and they pay for the medical bills and find them a really good forever home. So I love what they're doing. That's where I got Howard. Um, they're close to my heart. And, you know, this, I think the passion just came from, um, you know, they're voiceless. They, um, you know, are at our, you know, they're, they, they surrender to us. They depend on us. And to see someone, um, you know, just, abuse or neglect that these little precious souls just um ignites the most incredible emotion inside of me it's just uh, one of my passions i'm not exactly even sure where it came from but um i try to be the voice that they don't have and i will always commit my life to trying to help as many animals as i can it's just it breaks me you know what i mean so super close to my heart and you know Trent was never really a, an animal guy <laughs> until I met him and <laughs> I've uh, kind of converted him that way so I'm I'm grateful and I know Emma you're passionate about animals and I know you are too Bruce so I appreciate that and I think that um, you know we can make a difference for for these little guys and big guys yeah I mean, we love our puppies and and kitties and horses actually yeah because my wife Jean so she uh, supports a horse rescue place in Texas and so she's got a friend that works there so it's you know from from large and small there's a lot of need out there so there uh, is. yeah good stuff so well okay well we kind of wandered around a little bit we've tapped on it so maybe we'll just kind of focus in so as we were sharing so uh, Trent did a, a really nice job kind of introducing that and so uh, with the guys we kind of talked a little bit about so we're focusing this week on the issue of human trafficking And then the charity that we're sponsoring and supporting is in slavery. Um, We actually had a couple dialed up and both of the folks that we were working with ended up with COVID Mm -hmm. and couldn't participate. And so it was really too bad that way. So uh, we kind of had to do that. So in that, we talked a little bit about defining what we've already kind of talked about what human trafficking is. We talked about the different kind of forms it takes uh, from kind of servitude, forced labor, debt, bonding, all that kind of stuff. And and then including, of course, sex trafficking and that and child labor, so to talk a little bit about that. And then we looked at some of the numbers from the end slavery stuff um, website, talking around a minimum of 21 million people, up over 40 to 50 million people, kind of it's because it's such a moving target and really, really hard to identify. So all that said, and so we've kind of referenced, and Trent talked a little bit about, you know, what happened with you and all that, but um, so if you're all right, so Sarah, just, you know, if you don't mind sharing kind of that story about what happened to you and, um, and kind of how that may have impacted you as, you, as you've gone through that. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate the platform in order to talk about it because it is so close to my heart. Obviously, it, it is tough to talk about, but um, I think it's, it, it's my calling, it's my purpose, and I, I have to. Um, <sighs> So I just like to preface it with it is tough, um, but I am emotional because I think of of those who are fighting, and I have to speak up for them. So that's that's where the that's where the emotion comes from. Um, Certainly not from my situation, but for those who are affected by this. Um, so, you know, my, and part of part of the reason that I, I need to speak up is because this is normal and this is happening everywhere. And this is happening to very, very, you know, normal. I would like to think I'm a very normal person and, you know, this is happening everywhere. 
So I think it's important for me to talk about it because you sometimes you don't associate this with people you know. Um, but my story really just starts um, down in San Diego. Um, I had just gotten my job offer working um, at Fox Sports San, for Fox Sports San Diego. And I, I had just moved there. It had been a week since I, I moved. And I lived in La Jolla, um, one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Um, it just a really, you know, when my parents were helping me find an apartment, I said, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm a single woman living alone and I, I want to feel safe. So we decided on La Jolla and um, I said, you know, it was a beautiful area. And I, I one day I was like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid runner and I was going out for a run um, during my lunch break. And uh, it was noon, you know, in the middle of the day. And I was out on a run exploring the area. And I was running up a hill and saw this man um, who, I'm, who I didn't know. Um, and he, he was getting something out of his car and had his back door open. And um, as I ran past him, I, I noticed that he had something in his hand. And to be honest, it looked like a microphone. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, is he a reporter? Like, I'm a reporter. And I think that was one thing that potentially saved my life because my head was, was focused on him and he didn't catch me off guard. So he ended up turning around and grabbed me. And um, the, it, it all happened so quick, but um, there was a severe pain in my chest and I thought, I first looked at him and, and, and laughed because I was like, why are you touching me? And, um, but this pain in my chest was killing me. And I thought I looked down and, and he, he was holding something against my chest and I thought he had stabbed me. And so immediately I started freaking out and I tried to scream and nothing came out. So um, it, I was a little, I was so thrown off and so scared and it really wasn't until he took my head and shoved it and, and started to work my body down into the car. And then I, I mean, so many things flashed, flashed uh, through my mind. And, and one of them, this is just so crazy to me. Um, you know, back when I was in high school, I was homesick one day and there's nothing on TV ever. So I was watching Oprah and this woman had been uh, kidnapped and she was telling her story. And she said that she was in the back of the car and she thought to herself, if you stay in this car, you're gonna die. So on the freeway, she opened the car and flew out and she survived. But she said, I, you know, verbatim, if you're gonna be in that car, you're gonna die. And I heard this woman's voice talk to me and she said, if you get in that car, you're gonna die. So, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, I've taken a lot of self-defense and I'm tiny, but I remember thinking you've got way too much to live for. So I, I fought and I fought and I fought. I don't know how I fought. I just, I, you know, I punched, I did whatever I kicked and then I was able to scream. And he, then I noticed it was a taser that he had um, and he began to taser me. And I kept fighting and fighting and he grabbed my hair and just started kind of, you know, beating on me. And, and he was really close. And I looked him in the eyes the whole time because I said, you're not going to take this from me. This is, I'm, I've got too much to live for. And I stared him down. And I think that was another thing that contributed to, you know, me being able to get away was I was confident and I wasn't going to be his victim. He, he chose the wrong person. So I fought, fought, fought. He continued to tase me. Um, I didn't feel anything. I was so, everything was just crazy. And I maneuvered one way and was able to get, he only had one arm on me and I was able to get away a little bit. And I kicked and backtracked really fast and was able to get away. And as I was running, away, I, 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 I jolted into the middle of the road because I, you know, I'd rather be hit by a car at this point. I noticed on the car that there was a lift sticker. And I said, you know, don't, don't forget that, Sarah, that's important. You, you might be able to identify who this is if, if you remember that. So I ran into the middle of the road. And as I did so, um, there was someone driving down and I was screaming and I, I was, had my hands flailing and 
this young woman open, opened her door and I said, there's a man. I looked crazy, I'm sure. And I can't even believe she pulled over to pick me up. And I said, he's trying to kill me and he's over there. And he wasn't there anymore. He was in, he ducked in his car. So she picked me up and I said, just go, go, go. And I said, I, I, you know, she was so scared and, and, you know, I, I run with a fanny pack and I pulled out my phone and as it was happening, my mom continued, was continuing to call me. And my mom, you know, later told me that she had a really bad feeling, um, which is why she was trying to get a hold of me. So kind of crazy how that mother's intuition works, but um, this woman drove me and she drove me near my house, but I said, just in case he's following me, um, I would love to just get out here. And I looked at her and I said, listen, you're my angel. Thank you. You, you saved me. And I go, what's your name? And she said, my name's Sarah. What's your name? And I s- still gets me. I said, that's my name and you're my angel. So we, we never were able to find her, but she, um, she was my angel. Um, so I ran, um, I ran the rest of the way home and, you know, made some phone calls. And at the time, both my parents were in meetings, so they didn't answer. Um, and I called anybody I could. And then, uh, I called a friend and my friend said, what are you doing? You need to call the police. So <laughs> I called the La Jolla police department and they were like, you're crazy. You need to call 911. Like this is big. So Within minutes, I mean, La Jolla was, they were incredible. They had a helicopter out looking for him. Um, You know, police, I had like eight police officers in my little one bedroom apartment um, in the middle of the summer with no air conditioning. So that was great. Um, You know, but, but they were just so good to me. And, and um, we sat down and they started attacking it right away. And um, they said, you know, sex, sex traffic is very big in this area and we feel like this might have been an attempted abduction but at the time I was also on television so they thought it was potentially a stalking incident so you know um, I had a I had an uh, I had an, a detective with me right away and we were working on identifying what did he look like we were getting sketching going and uh, we were getting the whole process started so I'm just so grateful to them for acting fast and, and trying to identify who this guy was. Um, so, and, and that's kind of when, you know, I was, I was with them for hours and then um, all the police and, and the FBI, or not the FBI, I'm sorry, all the police and, and the detectives uh, left and kind of, I was alone for a little bit and um, everything just hit me. You know, I had severe pain in my chest. I had boils from getting tased and Um, it just was the weirdest feeling in the world, you know, not knowing who this guy was or what did he want. Um, and it was incredibly scary. So for the women that, you know, go through this, it's like what I, I, in my head, what I experienced really wasn't even that bad comparison, comparison to what, in comparison to what actually goes on on a daily basis when they do abduct these women or, or men, um, so, you know, uh, from there, it's a very, very long story, a very long process of um, trying to identify who, who he was and, and what he wanted. And, and through that, um, my incredible detective was able to determine that it was an att- attempted abduction for um, human and sex trafficking. So it, it had nothing to do with me. It was just um, wrong place at the wrong time. This is happening everywhere. And um, I think if, if I hadn't been so aware and, you know, I, I've, you know, taken the, the, the um, training, the, the self-defense training and, and the confidence with me, and I was, you know, caught off guard, but still prepared to fight. I think if I didn't have that awareness and I wasn't in tune, I think it would have been a different story. So certainly that's a whole nother topic of ways now that I, I teach women of how, how to carry themselves and how to be a little bit prepared for, you know, not to live in fear, but to prepare themselves. Um, but, you know, I, the La Jolla police department, the San Diego police department and, and my detectives, um, I mean, those people are, are incredible. So I, you know, I owe a lot to them because they helped, helped me kind of, um, figure all this stuff out. And um, we were able to um, all work together to to get some things solved. And it it didn't end exactly how I would have wanted it to. But, um, you know, I'm here. And that's all that matters. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that it happened to me because this is 
made me the woman I am today. And I will continue to fight, you know, for those who don't have a voice right now, you know? Sorry, it's, I, you know, the emotions are just power, you know, cause you just think of, think of everybody going through, you know, the women and men impacted by this and it's, just, it's overwhelming to me. So that's kind of where the emotions come in, are, are coming from. But um, I appreciate you guys listening. I know it's, it's a, a complicated story and there's a lot that goes into it, but um, I think at the end of the day, um, it's a win because, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to speak and I'm going to fight for those who can't right now. So, um, and to it changed the trajectory of my life because, um, it, you know, it, it's given me um, this passion to serve and to help, to help others. So um, I'm grateful and um, I, I just appreciate you guys listening for sure. Well, thank you. That's a really powerful story, Sarah. And so just really, really grateful for you to be with us and to share that. And, um, and you're right. I mean, I can't help but listen to that story. And even as we were preparing for this week, you know, reading the other stories from the different places that, you know, we're looking at and just all the people that are caught up in this. And just even when we listened to Trent, you know, he was kind of talking about it and it just like, cause we know you guys, you know what I mean? And it just normalizes it in a way like, you know, that's not supposed to happen to like, I guess, I don't know. I don't mean people like us necessarily. I just mean like in this kind of way, you know, it, and it just, you know, it, it normalized it in a way that made it, I think so much more real, even though we kind of heard about it, but listen to Trent talk about it. This is the woman he loves. He's committed his life to you. And just by the way, he really, really, really does love you. He's just head over heels about it. So, um, so, well, I've, um, my past, I've also had the opportunity to work with a lot of kind of crime victims and, you know, serious and violent offenses and that. And I just know, you know, the incident is one thing and the investigation and doing all that. And then everybody kind of goes home. And like you said, there you are kind of sitting in your apartment and then, and it's not just that night or that week or that month or that, you know, so there's a process. And so kind of, you know, as you were working through that, just how is, you know, so how long ago was this? I mean, it's been how many years now? Was it? It's, I'm coming up. So this year was year number four. So every, okay. every year on that day, I, I run a marathon to celebrate my running, um, which was something that was not taken from me, but you know, it, uh, originally it was, I was too scared to do it anymore, but so four years now. Yes. Okay. Well, that's why I was just wondering about it. Cause I, I, you can't go through something like that without it kind of changing how you view the world and you view people and different precautions you might take. So can you talk to us just a little bit about that evolution, about the impact it had on you and kind of what you've had to deal with and address and work through and you know because when I meet you you're a very strong powerful smart beautiful woman you know what I mean and so you do a great job you know but I know that that has been something so maybe just a little bit because it's not just that incident so where's it taken you and what you know what kind of things have you had to deal with well where I say it's been a blessing is because it, it got me into sports psychology which is my full-blown passion now um, without the event, I don't think that I would have gotten into sports psychology um, because right away, you know, obviously there's incredible trauma that comes with that. I, I like to pride myself on being a pretty tough person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty dialed and I, I'm, I'm tough, but um, I, I, it brought me to my knees. I, I was scared of everything and I couldn't live life. I didn't even like want to live life to how I used to. Um, I didn't even... I, looking back, it's like, I don't even recognize the person that I was. I mean, it's, it's everything to where, you know, um, I'm blessed. I had family and friends come in and, and live with me for a while, but, um, you know, after that, it's, it's like a rehabilitation. So, you know, I, at the grocery store, oftentimes if someone would come up to me, I would scream, um, or, you know, I'd be on a walk and I would see someone on their cell phone. And I remember thinking, oh my God, he's trying to kill me. He's on the phone with someone else and they're going to kill me. And I'll never forget too, I had to walk downtown to San Diego um, a couple of days after to meet, um, you know, to, with the DA. And um, he, you know, just walking downtown, every, every person that looked at me, I, I was fully convinced that they wanted to kill me. So just my outlook was so spewed. Um, you know, I, I thought that any car I saw was him. I would see him everywhere. I would see his face everywhere. 
Um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and see him on my balcony um, and throw up all the time. Um, it just, it was one of the most insane things I've ever dealt with because my mind had convinced me of all these crazy things. And, that, and that's a natural response. You know, our, our body and our mind is protecting us, um, which I understand now, but at the time I just didn't feel like I had any control. You know, here I am a young woman with my dream job and I'm, I'm terrified, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, that's when I decided to get some help and I met with a therapist and, and that changed the entire outlook on everything. And I was able to really process what had happened because a lot of the times when, when you, when we all face trauma, whether it's with a big T or a little T and, um, it's all begins with processing. And, and when you face really big T trauma like that, your mind isn't really able to process what exactly happened. And that's what, what results in that PTSD. And so, you know, being scared of everything. I, I mean, I was seeing, like I said, I saw him everywhere in the night terrors and it was, you know, it's something that still occurs, but um, you cert I certainly have the tools now um, when something does come up, I, I know how to address it. And so I think, you know, my work with my therapist, it, it totally changed my life. Um, you know, I think my faith in God helped me. Um, I, I think that was the first and foremost, the only way I got through that was my faith in God and knowing that I am here for a reason and I survived it for a reason. And now how am I going to ignite that fire and go and, and, and live and live my purpose now? And the really incredible thing that came out of all of it was I've got this zest for life every morning that is, I've never, it, it's unmatched of, I never lived like that before. You know, it was just another day for me. I, I wake up with zest, man. I've got, I've got energy and I'm excited because I've got a lot to live for. And I've, I've got so many, you know, passions and I just, I know that I'm supposed to be here. So I think the beauty that came in all of it was, um, I've got a clear vision. I know, I know what I want to do. I know how I want to help and I know why I'm here. Um, and, and two, I think, um, it just, it, again, it gave me a passion for this human trafficking. I didn't know anything about it before, you know, and, and there's stories that I see now that just, it's insane. It's, it's something I think about on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, you know, so it's, it's months and, and years of working on yourself. But uh, again, I, I harnessed my mind and then you have to change it into a good thing. So the good thing for me now is, is I overcame, um, you know, I'm not the same person that I was. I'm better than I was because of all of this. Um, it was an unfortunate thing what he did, but he made me stronger. I'm so much better for it now. And um yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is kind of crazy, but uh, the whole thing has been, I look at it as a pivotal blessing. I really do. And that's not just me saying that that's a belief. I believe that I believe that this was a good thing. And again, the zest for life is, is probably one of my favorite things in the world because I know what it's like to see it flash, you know, and, and who knows what would have happened, but um, there's no need to even think that way. It's, it's, um, you're here, you're here now and let's, every day's a gift. Let's, let's run with it, you know? Well, you know, you were talking earlier about working with athletes and about the value of being in the present moment, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? About being too much in the future and in the past. And, you know, one of the things the Stoics are really big on that is, mm -hmm. you know, that with, with the conscious awareness of how fragile life is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you experience something like you experienced it and you kind of see that flash before your eyes, it, it does, it seems like, have a tendency to ground us in a way that you do appreciate each day. You appreciate the relationships you have and the people that are in your life and the things you get to do and even the sun shining on your face. So, you know, and it's it's such a great thing that way. And so it's there too, just kudos too, because, you know, um, the ability, because really life does happen, right? And like, there's nothing that you did that caused that. It just, you know, the wrong place, wrong time, like you said. And then what we're left with is the choices that we make after life happens. You know, mm -hmm. how are we gonna respond? How are we gonna get up? What are we gonna do? What's our attitude? What choices will we make about who we wanna be given what happened? You know, and I know that's a very different journey for people in all these different situations, but just really commend you, you know, for that strength and 
you know, going from how difficult it was, you know, and that, that is very common, you know, about how much fear you had and seeing the person and worried about it and all that into the place that you're at now. So anyway, great, you know, just really powerful to hear, you know, your journey and kind of where you're at and also realizing that, you know, it's an ongoing process, you know, and it's still kind of an evolution of work, work in, in ongoing. So, well, thank you so much for sharing that. So, well, then, you know, with that, um, what would you, any recommendations to folks? So I guess I, I had a couple thoughts, just, you know, either personally, uh, do you have kind of suggestions, anything else, you know, to other women and or, because the other group that we had was actually working with, you know, middle school and high school age young men who get abducted and that didn't work out either. So, but, so certainly there's, isn't, there's no gender bias on this. I mean, I think women tend to make up the larger group, but there's still a lot of young men that are involved in it as well uh, from that. But um, any kind of suggestions that you'd like to, you know, as far as safety precautions and that and or people that aren't, haven't been impacted in that direct way, but what would you encourage them? You know, how can they help in slavery, uh, Tennessee or the other kind of human trafficking groups out there? What would you encourage people to do? I think this is a great question because this is part of the purpose and, and my passion now is how can I educate? How can I help? And I think it all starts with you never, no need to live in fear. Let's just be aware. Um, let's have a good awareness of our surroundings. So for men and women, you know, women uh, ex may experience this on a different level, you know, sometimes can tend to feel a little bit more vulnerable sometimes in certain situations, but men experience similar things as well. So I, I always preach, you know, have an awareness. You, there's no need to be on your cell phone while you're walking um, somewhere or to your car or walking to the grocery store or in the mall, wherever you are. Um, and, and, you know, these abductions can take place anywhere or, or, or whatever it may be, whatever um, can happen, you know, just have an awareness. Who's around me? Um, what do they look like? A big part of how we were able to progress in my case was I, I was able to identify what he, who this man, uh, what did he look like? Um, I said, if I look into his eyes, I can promise you I can identify this man. Um, so uh, that transitions nicely into having, carrying yourself with this confidence. What I tell women is when you walk, so sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself, like when I'm walking my dogs, it's, it's dark out and I'll pass by a stranger. Um, what I always do is I look them in the eye and I say, hi, good evening. How are you? So they know I have seen them and I know that they're there. Oftentimes I think as women, we crouch down and just keep walking. Well, it just shows, you know, like, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, people target someone who's already looks like a victim. So walk with pride. Um, let them know that you've seen them. They could be an incredible person, uh, but I, I still do the same things, um, you know, so, so let them know that you've seen them, you know, acknowledge them and really, um, you know, look at their features and, and, and just be aware. You don't have to be fearful, just, just be aware. And too, you know, I'm an avid runner, but you know, so many times I see women running um, in dangerous places or they're running um, without any, any sense of protection. So I think part of my message is, you know, on Amazon, there's a really great uh, small pepper spray, anything um, to make you just feel a little bit more confident and more comfortable. Also, there's no need to run with your ear pods blaring so loud that you can't hear anything. So I, I just, you know, I often challenge women, you know, turn down the volume a little bit or run with one in and one out. Um, have some pepper spray, have some sort of defense and, and don't be on your phone all the time, really unwa unaware of what's going on around you, know your surroundings um, and, and be confident. You've got way, the world needs your gifts and, and, and we need, uh, you know, uh, you to show up and be confident and, um, you know, there's, there's no need to, to be fearful or crouch or, or run away from something we're scared of. Um, and, and I think in my case, that confidence of um, you've messed with the wrong girl really saved me um, because he, he started to um, panic a little bit. So I think those are some of my main takeaways of just, you know, to, to be a little bit safer, I think. And, and finally, you know, he was a Lyft driver and, um, you know, sometimes uh, they found that predators will use Lyft or Uber stickers to 
reel in, um, you know, women. And I think, uh, oh, just be very careful when you're getting in a lift. Maybe you can call somebody, um, you know, what I do if I get into a Lyft or an Uber, um, you know, I wasn't able to take them for a while, but now I'm back in them. Um, I make sure that they say my name first of who's like, you know, when you, they have your ride, they're like, oh, who is this for Sarah? I make them say it first. I don't, I don't open the door and say, oh, for Sarah, because they'll, you know, they could just say yes. So make, make them say your name and, and take the, Take the proper precautions to make sure it's a safe ride. And if you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to get in. Never get in if you feel uncomfortable. I have to, I believe that we've got to trust our instincts on those type of situations. And, you know, uh, you know, you're very vulnerable when you get into someone's space. So um, the smallest little precautions could, could make all the difference. You know what I mean? And I think it all just starts with being aware. Okay. Well, uh, in the show notes, we're going to have uh, the website and stuff for In Slavery, Tennessee. And they've got a list of pieces, is both with volunteering and donations. And that they talk a little bit about uh, making sure that the businesses that we do business with are what they call slave free. So make sure that they've got a commitment on social justice issues that include not using bonded servitude or any of those kind of things, you know, particularly for companies that, you know, are outside the United States or make products and that kind of stuff. And then the biggest thing that they talk about, just like you said, is education, awareness, and then advocate, you know, speak up, you know, for this issue uh, where you can and try to make a difference in the ways that you might be able to. So, well, Sarah, you've been terrific. We really, really value and appreciate you telling your story. Is there anything else you'd like to add as far as encouragement or other suggestions that I don't want to cut you off in any way. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, I'm just grateful for the the ability to speak out about it. And I think if, if I could just send everyone home with a challenge, it would just be, you know, do, do 15 minutes, spend 15 minutes educating yourself on what's going on um, in our backyard. You know, this is a big issue. It's happening everywhere. Um, and there's ways that even, even uh, us as, as regular people can be on the lookout um, for something that might be a little abnormal, um, you know, and, and certainly there's really incredible stories of someone who said something, um, hey, this doesn't feel right. This maybe feels like an abduction. Um, and they found the people because uh, someone else has spoken up. Um, there was an incident on a plane where a man had a had a young a young woman, and and they were able to save her because someone spoke up and said this looks a little fishy. So, use your eyes, educate yourself, and uh, let's let's go out and make a difference. It all starts with us. But you know, again, the little things can add up and in, in, into big things. So I think we we can all play a role for sure. But it starts with education. Okay. Then last, we ended with Trent on this too. So we like it because it's kind of the holiday season and you have your beautiful red top on. So you're very festive. So what, what, are, what are one or two things that this time of year are giving you hope and whether it's related to this issue or not, but what, what are things that you're hopeful about right now? Well, you know, I, I, my big hope is, is in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, he, my faith has carried me through my best days and some of my worst. So that's where a big glaring hope comes from, comes uh, for me, but also um, in, in kind of, I, I think my hope would be, you know, I, I, I try and hunt the good on a daily basis. I look for good and there's a lot of good out there. So sometimes we just have to change our lens and see the good. And, and sometimes be the good. So um, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, really incredible people out there, um, such as you guys doing doing amazing things um, like, like this. So um, I think those are two really hopeful things. We've got really good people out there. Um, and yeah, and the Christmas, Christmas of spirit, um, you know, our Lord and Savior. So thank you guys so much. I'm appreciative for sure. All right. Well, we'll continue to try to spend the message, sp spread the message and along with some love and kindness uh, and see what we can, can get. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Anything else, Emmy? Sarah Taylor, everyone. Yeah, Sarah Speaking Taylor. Speaking up for animals and people who can't speak for themselves. Um, I have to say, I didn't quite, I mean, I know that you ran marathon, you were running before, but I didn't quite understand the weight of your running now. Um, so I... Uh, thinking I might want to run with you. Let's so, run, girl. Want to run? Let's run. I'll I would run love to run you. with you. Let's go. <laughs> okay, well, we love you. Thank okay. you so much. Um, 
I'll text you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sarah. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys so much. Welcome to our last segment of the show. Uh, this is questions with baby brother. Hi. Um, I also just want to say nobody has guessed the numbers. Uh, I gave two you, of you are seven out of the eight. Literally right there, but we're not going to give you any more clues because otherwise it's just giving the number away. So if there's not a correct answer by the end of this episode, I'm taking it off the menu. It's pretty obvious. No, 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 it's gone. And then I'm going to make a new challenge because this one I feel like should be pretty easy. Like. I, 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 I'm with George. I hand fed a cure. I'm 100% with George. I gave it to you. Like signed gloves, y'all. Signed gloves. Maybe. Not anymore. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. So, Anyways, uh, we but have two I do want to say real quick, thank you to all the Niners, the women of the Niners, Niners fans that came out and did yoga with my sister and my wife. They had a blast. Um, I know Emma will probably touch on that a bit more, but my wife also had a blast. Um, so thank you for showing both them support and the San Francisco 49ers, um, now known as the Glendale San Francisco 49ers. But well, let's just say something. So the so routine that I taught, and if you haven't done it, um, we're going to be uploading on our YouTube, so it'll be back. But um, Sorry. it's the restorative, it's a restorative yoga practice that I do with George. And we came up with this because- You're giving people our secrets? Well, we came up with this. <sighs> yoga's for everyone. It's a tool. I'm kidding. But we came up with this because when we were doing yoga in the beginning, uh, it was so dynamic and everything. And then finally George was like, yo, I just, we gotta chill. And then I took a restorative yoga session and I, it like finally hit me, you know, because I do not compete or train at the level that George does. And- mm. <sighs> Yes, I do. No, no, no. Um, but just that level of stress. And I feel like sometimes when you think about yoga and it's like the hot power yoga and you kind of flow through it. So when we started realizing how effective and just healing or started yoga practice was not just to his physical body, but also to mental, emotional, spiritual, it, I feel like it just put all the dots together. So if you have not ever experienced restorative yoga, go YouTube some stuff. You're going to tip me out of my chair. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so big shout out women of the Niners. Thank you for having us on. We would love to partner with y'all again soon. Um, yeah. So, all right, let's get into the questions. So we have two questions tonight. Um, this one's from Wyatt, Ryan Quayley. Hi, Ryan. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, just want to say thank you for listening to Hidden Pearls podcast. And um, if you're of age, drink a Bud Light. And thanks for the book. I, I didn't, I'm like, it always makes me so happy that he's listening. We'll get to, we'll get to the end. All right. So, hey man, big fan. I was wondering how you go about off season training wise. Do you take any time to recover or are you right back at the gym training? Do you know how to relax? I'm throwing that in there. Um, maybe this year was different with the injury. By the way, how is the foot doing with your healing as a fantasy owner? It would be great for the update. Thanks. Savage. Fantasy, fantasy update. I'm glad that you got all of that. Now, um, the rest of it, off-season training. Um, I love the off-season, but it is not an off-season um, because it is your opportunity to get ahead of the competition. It's your chance to take a step forward. Um, and as Bruce, you know, one thing that I do love about my dad is he's great with, he loves laminating cards with sayings on them that he thinks will help. Um, Video no, no, but help with like your mental training and your focus. and. One of my favorite ones, I, they, that's why I'm bringing it up, is because they do help. One of my favorite ones is um, small, consistent steps in the right direction lead to great results. And that is something that I say to myself um, based on a daily basis. Um, it's also on our mirror in the gym. It's on, our, it's on my mirror in the gym. It is. Um, it is, like I said, it's something that I say to myself on a daily basis. Uh, daily basis. And so um, that, so to me, every day in the offseason is another step towards my goals of, you know, and the NFL. And so that's something I use all the time. And, um, but yes, I do know how to relax. Um, I take some time off after the season. Um, I've gone from not being in the playoffs to going to the Super Bowl. have not had an in-between yet. Um, so I've had, um, you know, when we didn't go to the Super Bowl after 2018 season, um, I went to the Pro Bowl, which was really fun. Um, but 
I really didn't know what the Pro Bowl was at that time. So I like still trained for it like it was a real game. That was a waste of my time. But um, if I had to do it over again, um, I would definitely, I think after my rookie year, I took a month off. Um, but I'm big into taking like three or four weeks to myself. Um, I, I work out mildly, you know, like I stretch, do some yoga, some mental stuff, but I'm not front squatting 300 plus pounds or anything like that. I'm not doing sprints. I'm not running routes. It takes some, you know, cause you know, football is a grueling sport. And when you start, when I start my off season training, I'm in football mode from usually, um, the Super Bowl um, or the week of the Super Bowl or a month afterwards, like it was last year. And I am straight through until my season's over. And that's just kind of how I do. And I take a little week, you know, in the middle of June or July um, to myself and I'll get a little, you know, recovery time, but it is, it's a straight through shot for me. And I think that works really well for me because once I get going on something, it's I'm locked and loaded. Injuries do suck though. Yeah. yeah. They're not nearly as fun, but um, I'm practicing and I'm catching footballs again. I'm having an absolute blast. So it's actually been really fun this last week watching people posting like the media will be like, George Kittle was on practice. I'm like, it's been so long since I've seen you on social media. I disappear very easily. It's very fun. It's very fun. Thank you, Ryan, for the question. Um, okay. Next question is from Lydia T. Lydia, Lydia, you are on fire. You are. I have to not choose your questions sometimes, and I regret that. You've hidden her questions from me? How <laughs> dare you? I ask questions, and Lydia always what? asks great questions. <sighs> Lydia? Lydia, I'm sorry for my sister. She can be so rude sometimes. I'm not rude. I'm spreading it out. How dare you? We brought her back. All right. Uh, could you see yourself starring alongside The Rock in a movie someday? If so, what movie genre, and what would your character be like? Wow. 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 Oh. Wow. 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 Mm, I would love to be in a movie with The Rock. Um, I don't really know how my acting skills are. I actually just saw something with, um, totally just going to go sideways on this, but I just saw something with Matthew McConaughey where he said that when um, everything after the first take is acting, um, because your first take is how you actually respond to the, that situation, like you don't know what's actually coming, uh, you know, to an extent. And so, I thought about that because my entire really career, every time I've done videos and media stuff, I am a one take wonder. Um, so I don't know how good of an actor I am, but I am good at living in the moment. I specialize in living in the moment. So um, I could do something action-y. I could, I think I could do some comedy stuff. I think a Jumanji movie would be really fun. If, you know, if The Rock was ever in a Godzilla movie, I would love to be in that. Yes. yes that'd be really fun for me i'll do it yeah like i said jumanji would be pretty fun for me um he grew up on that movie as well so if there's any you know other arcade you know game wayne we here i'm really athletic too i could probably be a stunt i okay. could use some more tequila too we could we drink it heavily as a fan so. that bad all right uh any last shout oh the zenny collection Ooh, the zenny collection by the kittles me and my wife the glasses um, blue blocker glasses, which protect your eyes if you're looking at a screen all day, uh, such as the laptop we're recording on or your cell phone. Um, so if you're on those things all day, blue light blockers really help with that to protect your eyes. You won't feel so dry, itchy, and sore. Um, that's really cool. We've got really cool shades on them. Um, I've been wearing them everywhere. If you guys have seen them, let me know. If you guys have them, let us know, because that's really cool. Thank yeah, tag us. So much for the support. Um, but I'm a huge fan of that. And huge shout out to Zinni really for letting us get the whole thing done because it was a really fun project for me and Claire. We really enjoyed the whole process. So last but not least, Wooga, if you're still listening, <laughs> carry me, gosh darn it. Carry me to a victory on the All right, bye y'all.